19. Our first order of business tonight is approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any changes or additions to the agenda? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Motion okay. is second. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And the agenda is approved. Next thing is the approval of minutes from the July 22nd, 2019 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Make a motion to approve the, the motion. Minutes. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And the minutes are approved. Next, we are on to reports. First, we have our MTS reports, and we have um, Amy. Amy Venowitz here today. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I had Venowitz. I had the hard yes. in my head. <laughs> no problem there. Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, last week on Monday, the last meeting of the TAB policy work group for the regional solicitation occurred and they made their final recommendations. So over the course of about three months, the group developed recommendations on how to change the regional solicitation, uh, specifically in the categories of the roadway applications, trail and transit applications. Uh, they have developed a recommendation on how to change how we score the equity component of all the applications and also for creating a unique projects category. So the recommendations are fairly detailed and kind of extensive. The schedule from this point on out is that the recommendations will go for an information item to tab next week. They will go for an information item to the Transportation Committee on August 26th. And at that point, it will be a fairly long information item at the committee. And then after that point, we are intending to make staff available to meet one-on-one -on -one with members, either on the transportation committee or other council members who have questions because they are <clears throat> detailed and just even understanding the regional solicitation um, is pretty detailed. So we'll have that opportunity over about a month. And then TAB will release uh, the application for public comment in mid-September. We will get the public comments and then go through any changes based on public comment that would occur in November. And then um, we prepare the online application and it's not eventually released until February. So there is quite a bit amount of time between now and the actual release, um, but these recommendations help us go forward with creating the ap actual application. And if there are big concerns, the next month is going to be the time that we will have opportunity with council members to get feedback from you. So at that point, that's the schedule, and I don't know if either of you want to comment on the works. Uh, I, work. I guess my only comment, I think it's been a really, really good process. It brought a, together a group with a lot of varied backgrounds who found consensus on some things, which is sometimes hard to do, but it was a result of a lot of really good conversations, and I think it will lead to better outcomes, I think. Uh, I, I said it on the meetings as well, and it is not having been familiar with TAB and the solicitation um, other than knowing that it exists, basically. Uh, very uh, complex, so hard to tweak something that you're just learning about in the meantime, but staff was certainly excellent in helping bring me up to speed on this. I learned a lot in the meetings about how the whole process works, and it was very, very valuable to me, I think. Uh, for me, the takeaway, the big takeaway, and I'll be curious to hear how everyone else feels about it, is the equity piece, which I thought was just uh, hugely um, valuable as far as an improvement goes for the way it was was being conducted and the proposed changes. One quick question, Amy, um, if I may. Um, uh, how, how was public comment solicited? Uh, Madam Chair and members, it it. it is an official public comment period, so it will be 45 days long, and there will be an opportunity for a public comment in front of the tab. At the, uh, for the solicitation, they serve as the public comment board, 
Um, but then there will be online public comments um, by mail and then also at the public hearing itself. And at the end of the public comment period, we create a public comment report with a response to each of the comments received. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. It was very beneficial to me, so thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Deb. Mm -hmm. You bet. Um, anything else? Okay. Anyone have any other questions for Ms. Edelitz? All right, if not, we'll move over to reports from General Manager Boyster. Okay, Welcome. I'm Chair. Um, first report, I want to remind folks that uh, on Saturday, July, uh, August 17th, rather, uh, will be the, the first day of the quarterly service changes that we went that we came to you about a month ago and, and went over and reviewed with you. Those are the service changes that, uh, that we do on a quarterly basis for our picks. But we had uh, a, a number of service changes that were driven uh, by our driver shortage. We, we spoke at, that, at the time of the uh, Committee of the Whole about the importance to our riders of knowing what to expect when we faced this last year, as you may recall in our report, that uh, we, we did not make the service changes we needed to make to accommodate the driver, uh, the operator shortage, and it led to people uh, having inconsistent service. And so we've eliminated some trips, uh, a number of trips, not routes, but trips within where people can, can uh, find a trip either before or after the trip they normally take. But it will cause some concern of riders and and I'm not, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. It's a change for people, and it's a change for people who have schedules, and uh, we understand uh, that that creates disruption in, in families and it creates disruption in households when we make those changes. Uh, the choices were not good, so this is how we decided to approach it, which is where we, need, where we had to go eventually last year so that people at least knew what to expect. And, uh, as a, and maybe as a side note on that, um, uh, the other part, the, the operator shortage last report I've received is, is at about 60 right now. Uh, I think last year at this time it was around 90. So uh, I guess if you want to view it as the glass half full, we have, we're in better shape than we were last year, but we have, still have challenges ahead. I understand there's uh, 13 starting today and we have 18 in a new class. I've, when I spoke with Aaron Kosky about it, he said referrals that some of you have given him have, have, been, have been welcomed and he's been trying to follow up on each one of them. So as you have ideas on how we can promote the, the, uh, the operator position to, to people who need jobs, uh, please keep those ideas coming and, and uh, they're all appreciated. Um, they're also on the August change uh, on August 19th, because we're not changing Green Line service on the weekend, so this won't occur until early Monday morning on the 19th. Uh, that will be the first day that we'll be halting Green Line service between the approximate hours of 2 to 4 p.m. We do have, we won't be halting services per se, we'll be halting Green Line services and we'll have replacement bus services that will replace the, the, uh, the, the routes that, that uh, or the trips that the Green Line would have otherwise provided. So there will be service available to people who need to use that service at that time of night for the destination. We have uh, a 40 foot buses on each end of the line that are ready to provide that service. We have backup to that if, if, if our estimates on the, number of, of, on the number of need or the amount of riders is, is underestimated. We have backup on that and we have backup to the backup plans in that regard. Uh, with respect to the uh, to the issue of people using transit as shelter. Uh, I'll just mention that one of the strategies we were using was to uh, apply uh, uh, vouchers that were dedicated for people using transit as shelter. And the most recent numbers I've had on that is that um, we have so far housed 35 individuals, 34 in a housing search, and uh, 23 referrals are in the process of, uh, for our referral process for getting a voucher. Uh, we've touched 173 people in this regard. Uh, that means that about 81 referrals did not develop, and most of those for lack of response or lack of follow-up from the individuals that we were trying to find placement for. I'll mention on uh, the 19th, the early morning of the 19th, we are going to have um, uh, work outreach workers on each end of the line. Uh, in, the, in the Hennepin County side, on the on the, the Target Station side, we'll have, eight, we'll have two outreach workers from St. Stephen's. We'll have healthcare, one individual there from Healthcare for the Homeless. Uh, Streetworks is going to have a two to four person outreach team, and Minneapolis Police, Police Department is going to provide two two community navigators on the Ramsey side. 
Um, healthcare for homeless will also be on that side of the river. Of the river. Uh, we'll also have uh, St. Paul Police Department coast officers, two coast officers, two outside in outreach workers, um, and of course our own HAT team. And uh, I'm and we, in over the summer, received a, a commitment from Catholic Charities to make beds uh, available to individuals that are disrupted uh, in in this process. And I, when I spoke uh, with staff today about what we should expect on the 19th. They believe that anybody who wants shelter will receive shelter if, if it's the, the same numbers of people they're seeing on the train. Uh, they said, of course, there are gonna be some people who, who will not uh, want a shelter option, and uh, there may be, and there'll be some that have tickets and will take the replacement bus service, I'm sure. So, but they believe that anybody that wants shelter will, ha will, will be able to find a shelter bed for them. Councilmember Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. Um, have we, um, I know, I, I don't know that I've heard this, but I, I've asked about it before. Do we have any organizations that are partnering who specialize in young adults experiencing or young ch or children experiencing homelessness who are sheltering on buses? Madam Chair, Councilmember, I don't know the answer to that, but let me, let me ask to see if, if, who we've been working with and whether they have some individuals. I will tell you, and this is an end, I'll admit to being an end of one, when we did the survey, we didn't see very many young people on, on, on the, during the survey, but that's not to suggest they're, they're not there. Yeah, I definitely chair, um, got feedback from a number of organizations that work with two organizations that work with young people who um, talked about both um, on the train, but also in some of the transit kind of hubs um, that, that there are, young people are there. Um, they may not present in the same way or feel safe disclosing either. So that's why I think sure. it's important to use an organization who has expertise in working with particularly um, 14 to 25 year old um, young people. Okay, thank you. Um, I also want to update you on the uh, on the electric bus chargers. Uh, in the, we've, you've received information in the past that we've had to take out the bus chargers because they were overheating. Uh, we've, we immediately brought a temporary charger in that we were using when we were testing the buses and testing the chargers before service started. Uh, those temporary chargers take about three times as long to charge a bus as the, as, as the, the chargers that which we were expecting to be part of this service. So we're getting two buses out uh, in service throughout the day, sometimes three. Uh, so it's not, and we, we, this hasn't disrupted service because we've been added, able to add ABRT diesel buses to make up for that service. In terms of our chargers that are being looked at because of the problems, a prototype was delivered to our organization uh, on August 5th. They did testing on the prototype and the testing was, was very positive. So uh, with that information, they're going back and they're they're now in the process of fixing the chargers that we had to send back to them. And I'm gonna guess in two to three weeks, uh, this is, this is uh, I, I'm an estimate, so uh, I will inform you if otherwise, but in two to three weeks, we should have some chargers back in place that, that would allow us to get uh, more buses on, on uh, more of the electric buses on the street than two to three. But again, this is a learning process. We knew this coming into it. And, uh, and we're, we're taking it a day at a time, but people are very motivated to get the electric buses back on the street. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for our general manager? All right, very good, thank you. Uh, then we're on to our business for the evening. The first item is our consent agenda. There are three items on consent. Um, you'll note that the third is a third week item. So even though it appears on our consent agenda, it comes through on the regular agenda for full council. So um, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent items. So moved. Motion is there a second? Second. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. And the consent agenda is passed. On to non-consent items. Our first one, well, we actually have a series of things for um, uh, Southwest LRT. So we've got um, Jim Alexander and John Hollick here to talk to us. The first one um, is, starts with item 2019-180. So welcome. 
All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we get into the business items, just want to give you all an update on the project, uh, a couple of construction slides, and and, and uh, we have been giving the Transportation Committee uh, an update on right-of-way on a quarterly basis, so I'll touch on that as well. Uh, so a project update, uh, and then we'll tackle these uh, four business items here. So I've first and now, so I'm Jim, Jim Alexander, project director for the Southwest LRT, if you don't remember who I am. Um, so here's a uh, first image, uh, July outreach activities. Uh, we are out uh, at the OPA station, uh, taking folks around uh, the OPA station area, just uh, showing where the station is going to go. It's actually a lot of construction going on out in this area, um, just uh, across the street. There's uh, apartment uh, structures, uh, actually foundations going in. And then uh, in, uh, later in July, we had, uh, we had uh, open houses at each of the five cities and had pretty good attendance uh, with that. Uh, so uh, and some of you have participated. I know I uh, saw Chair uh, Councilmember Cummings at the Hopkins, and uh, so we had pretty good attendance on that. Uh, so I have some slides to uh, just go through, starting out at the west end of the project. Uh, this is Southwest Station, where the contractor continues to uh, put in sheeting for uh, uh, future uh, permanent retaining walls. You see off to the right there, that's the element uh, uh, project that's uh, well underway and will be joined with the uh, work we're doing out at the uh, Southwest Station. And I've got uh, one of our business items relates to the operation and maintenance of, of the Southwest Station with uh, Southwest Transit that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, this next image is uh, pile driving at Golden Triangle Station. Uh, we continue to uh, to install uh, piling for the for this for the station at this location. Uh, this little this is really this is the the uh, western end of a long bridge that goes over over uh, Shady Oak and 212 and uh, continues to the north up to City West. Uh, it's a demolition activity uh, near Smetana Road in Minnet Minnetonka. Uh, this is kind of the, the finishing elements of that activity. And uh, we installed a new parking lot at the Hopkins Depot, Depot to, uh, to uh, essentially have a temporary parking area for, uh, uh, for trail users and uh, folks that need to get to the depot there uh, as we are uh, using the, uh, the existing parking lot for a staging area for the uh, <coughs> so we'll go over Excelsior. Next up, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Avenue, we, uh, uh, the contractor uh, demoed the pedestrian bridge that crosses Louisiana. You see in place there is the freight bridge that will eventually come out as well, but that will be timed with uh, uh, first a, a bridge has to be put in place to handle the freight traffic as they uh, navigate through this area. But ultimately, we'll have a freight bridge, uh, an LRT bridge, and a pedestrian bridge at this location. And in the Kenilworth corridor, uh, the clearing and grubbing, uh, a lot of activity. There's actually been uh, been more activity uh, in the in this area. We've uh, contractors started working in the channel in the, the channel between uh, uh, Lake of the Isles and Cedar Lake. And uh, here's that here's an image of that the WPA wall in the Kenilworth channel. And the contractors uh, installed a concrete batch plant that will uh, will handle concrete needs for the project. This is located in the Linden Yards in Minneapolis, uh, between the Bryn Mawr Station and the uh, and the uh, Bassett Creek uh, Station. And then finally, it might be my last construction image. Uh, this is the Glenwood Avenue Bridge demolition in Minneapolis. You can see that uh, the freight underneath that, that's uh, called the Wyzetta subdivision operated by BNSF and we have to work closely with them as we, uh, we do this work. And then stepping out west a little bit, uh, LRV assembly, Siemens uh, uh, has a, we have a contract with them to build 27 vehicles. Uh, Siemens uh, uh, essentially built out the, uh, the fleet for the central corridor. And uh, this is a very similar car to that that uh, they're they're producing for uh, for this uh, this phase of the project. Um, Jim, just one second. I think we have a question, uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Um, this is going back to just the south. I was waiting for you to, on the Southwest LRT. Sure. So um, unfortunately, this week we learned that um, our contractor sent out some notification in a way that was not. Um, meeting our expectations and certainly at the ex expectations of of the community and I'm just and I we, it got handled really quickly and I did get some positive feedback from one of the community members who was concerned about the communication that went out but what are we doing to kind of go forward um, 
to make sure that the community, when the contractor is responsible for um, or able to do communication directly with the community that it meets our standards and, um, and expectations. Sure, Madam Chair, Council Member. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. There was a bit of activity on Friday just to get everybody dialed in. Uh, what had occurred is the our contractor, LMJV, had uh, had sent out uh, notices that there was going to be construction on uh, Saturday through that waterway. I'll pull, pull that slide back up again. And that was done via, uh, via a permit issued by the city. And uh, we had, we had uh, several concerns with that. It was kind of sprung on us that uh, this was dropped in mailboxes, and which isn't that's a no no, and uh, and it had some incorrect information, namely our hotline number was incorrect. Uh, this is an, this is information that the contractors are required to put together, and uh, so we had our folks scrambling, frankly, on Friday to get that cleared up. And uh, oh, a lot of great thanks to uh, Sam O'Connell and uh, Sophia Guinness to get in front of that. And uh, so since then, we've uh, we've gotten the contract, got in front of the contractor, LMJV, to say we need to have a better process as this goes on next time. This is a responsibility, but we will take it on to make sure that we have a chance to review that information before it goes out. And uh, it did cause some confusion, and we have enough uh, challenges it is. We don't want to add to it. And uh, so hopefully we can uh, prevent that from happening again. Uh, Council Member Sterner. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I was also hearing that there's some disruptive with a bicyclist and that, and I don't know, what the, was that able to be rectified where they had uh, alternate trails and things like that, or they're back up on trails? Sure, Madam yeah. Chair, sure, Council Member, that has been kind of an ongoing uh, conversation with the trails. Uh, we're, it's, uh, it's really kind of a moving target, and we're trying to keep in front of that. We do take uh, input from the community. They took uh, the, the team takes input from me. I, I bike those trails a lot. And uh, and so, in fact, actually, we're meeting this week to, to kind of talk about uh, where we are right now with all the uh, all the comments, how are things working. I know there's been some challenges uh, since Glenwood has been closed that the uh, trail access into downtown, in and out of downtown, is is, uh, is a bit challenging compared to where it was before. And frankly, going back to uh, uh, before construction, you know, I was part of a uh, of a group where we rode to try to find a good route to get in and out of downtown. It's not easy with, with Glenwood being closed in particular. So um, that is that is always going to be a challenge. And uh, in some cases, we do have to get folks on the roadway, which uh, is not our preference, but that's kind of where we're at. But uh, we continue to take a look at that. And uh, I think there was, you may have noticed there was an article in the Star Trib uh, over the weekend uh, to talk about that, that uh, there are some challenges with that. And we're, so we're going to continue to examine and uh, fine tune as we can. All right, thank you. Okay. Yes, all right, go ahead, Jim. <clears throat> all right, so I wanted to give an update on DB achievement uh, on construction. And so these numbers are low for LMJV and the uh, that QMS, that's the uh, quality management services. But this, uh, just keep in mind, these are early in the contract. And so we anticipate that these numbers will get, get bigger and better as we move into the, into the project. And so LMJV is currently with a 16% goal that they signed up to. As they signed the contract, they are at 9%. Uh, VITE is a contract that's uh, pretty much uh, close to being done. That was for the demolition at, in Hopkins for the, the uh, former OMF site. They've uh, achieved about a 19% uh, DB goal. That, as I indicated, that contract's about, about wrapped up, so that number will be close to final uh, when we get finished up. The Braun uh, contract, the, again, that's the quality management services. This is the contractor or the consultant that does uh, testing for us, soil, concrete testing, inspection. Uh, they have a goal of 15% and we're just under 2%, but that number will increase. And uh, we do have OEO staff uh, monitoring this on a regular basis, and we'll continue to report uh, to you all uh, as the numbers as we, as we talk on a quarterly basis on the project. Okay. Um, thank you. We've got a question, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there consequences for not meeting the DBE goals? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, we have a number of contracts that we're carrying on the uh, consultant front. And uh, frankly, I don't have those in my head, but I know overall uh, we're around 18% uh, goal and we are achieving that for an overall. I, maybe perhaps next time that we, we come to you, we can report to you on the consult, consultant side of things. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Chair. One of the things that we're, we're aware is that um, 
we do good in some communities with DBE and not good in others. And I don't know that we've seen back that we're targeting those that are underrepresented in our DBE, for example, African American community and Latino community. And so I'm just curious how um, are we doing in that context as it relates to this, or is it continuing to be, I think it's primarily Asian and women owned businesses. Sure, Madam Chair, Council Member, we are, we are tracking all of those. And uh, I don't know if anybody's from OEO, or unfortunately, John Tao is out in California at a, at a conference read at DBE. So he would be knowing that the, I was gonna see if Sai is here. But I don't, see, I don't see anybody from Office of okay. Equal Opportunity. Next time, uh, we we could we could give you an update on on, on those matters. I, I'm, I apologize. I just don't have that level of detail. That's okay. That's sure. I think it, just having that DBE information disaggregated when we see it is is yep. what's all that's needed. Sure. All right. Any other questions right now? All right. Go ahead, Jim. All right, the last uh, item that we uh, we give you an update on on a regular basis is right away. And I can report to you that uh, things are in pretty good shape right now. Uh, uh, we have uh, 42 public parcels that uh, we uh, are looking to acquire. And uh, we have completed 40 of those. We're, we're doing some last wrap up on a couple of them. Uh, no issues there, just need to get the paperwork finalized. And on the private uh, side of things, that the number total number actually should be 194 up there at the top. Uh, the private parcels, 152 all told. We do now have uh, title and possession of all 152. And uh, you can see we have acquisitions complete, 62 of those, and uh, a number of those are in the settlement process or going through uh, commissioner hearing related to condemnation uh, that are still ongoing. But essentially for the, provide the, the area for the contractor, uh, we have that all available to the contractor now. So that's a pretty good situation. And then a uh, number of displacees were, uh, were involved in, in some of these uh, acquisitions and uh, all of it have been relocated. And we're just working on paperwork on, uh, on finalizing those, those elements. So Madam Chair, if there are any other questions. Uh... Okay. Any other questions? All right, then we can move on to the business items. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So this first item I'll cover, uh, it relates to the Systems Contract Award. And I've got a little background here. Uh, we have uh, 20 traction power substations, essentially uh, brings electricity from Excel to our system to operate the trains via overhead catenary system. Uh, we have three tunnel system houses related to this, uh, two at the Kenilworth Tunnel and one at the uh, Trunk Highway 62. Uh, and there's, of course, there's tunnel facilities associated with that communications, uh, radio, telephone, and emergency systems. And uh, we have uh, emergency call boxes at all the stations, and we have intrusion detection at the tunnels, on bridges, uh, and uh, of course, fire alarms. There's uh, signaling system systems associated with this, both for LRT and for freight. And there's uh, also uh, system integration involvement and uh, pre-rep testing support that the systems contractor is going to, uh, going to uh, provide. So OEO, uh, Office Equal Opportunity, set a goal for this contract before we went out for procurement at 12%. And we have the workforce goals of 32% for people of color and 20% of women participation, similar to what we have on the civil contract. And a panel of partners from Minneapolis and the county, MnDOT and MDHR reviewed and provided input on the bidder's DBE and workforce submittals. So the recommendation here, and I might want to back up before I get into this, there were three bids. Uh, uh, so, and they, they, they range from 194 to about 199 million, very close uh, given that magnitude of a number, we feel pretty good about that. So we are prepared to uh, go to you tonight here to uh, recommend that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute a contract for systems construction for the Southwest LRT project to Aldridge Parsons, a joint venture for 194 million, 411,000. And this, this will be contingent upon receipt of a letter of no prejudice, which has been made. We made that request shortly after we received the bid, bids in early June, we submitted a request to FTA uh, for this LONP. And then also approval of the LONP work from Hennepin County. So Madam Chair, that's uh, the business item for this item. Any questions from council members? Uh, Councilmember Zarin. Um, yes. Um, 
we don't really know a whole lot about Aldridge Parsons. Could you talk a little bit? I know there's a local Parsons. Uh, that's not the partner that is part of this. Could you explain that arrangement? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Aldridge. Actually, we at the project office are familiar with Aldridge. They were the uh, contractor for systems on the central corridor of the Green Line project, and uh, and they are now uh, joint venturing with uh, Parsons, who is an engineering firm. And we kind of look at them. We think that they're going to be more uh, coordinator, uh, scheduler type type thing on this uh, on this project. Well, we, we've learned more after we contract with them. Actually, the arrangement what they have, Aldridge certainly will be the lead because they do the, the bulk of the work and uh, learn more about, about what Parsons is going to be doing. But it's not the local Parsons you're thinking. <clears throat> thank you. Any additional questions? Council Member Sterner. Well, thank you, Chair. I just thought for the sake of the general audience, could you kind of determine, tell us what the letter of no prejudice is? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, love to. Um, that's a, that essentially, it's a re request to FTA to essentially award contract and spend money on that contract in advance of a full funding grant agreement. It's uh, something that uh, FTA has set up as part of their new storage projects. And we did this on Central Corridor, I think about nine times. And we've done it once so far on this project where we get that approval uh, before we award the contract. And it's important we do that in that sequence because uh, we want to make sure that those monies that are spent on that contract are eligible for uh, federal reimbursement. We, if you recall, we were looking for about 46% of that $2 billion uh, price tag for the project to be funded by FTA through that full funding grant agreement. So this the LONP is part of that process to make sure that we ensure that we get that reimbursement should, uh, you know, once we get the FFGA. Okay, All right, thank you. Okay, additional questions? All right, if not, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2019-180, Southwest Light Rail Transit Systems Contract Award. So move. Motion, is there a second? Second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. Business item is approved. Uh, next one. All right, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members. Joan Hollick, Deputy Project Director for Southwest, presenting business item 2019 179 requesting the authorization to negotiate and execute an amendment to the project's existing capital grant agreement with Hennepin County. Um, first, I want to provide some background on the existing agreement. That agreement was executed in December of last year, which provided $434.9 million worth of funds for project activities through August of this year. Now, many of those activities were construction related design support and the actual civil construction that Jim spoke of in previous slides, in addition to right estate, real estate acquisition, real property um, relocation, as well as project office expenditures for professional services and commitments that we've made in our third party agreements, which includes many of our freight rail agreements. Um, that funding and authorization is provided through August, so an amendment is needed. The August date was identified late last year as the time at which we'd hope to be in receipt of the full funding grant agreement. We have not yet applied for that agreement. We continue to work with FTA and our partners at Hennepin County to expeditiously submit our application for that agreement, and we hope to have that in hand by early next year. So the amendment before you today will add $118.6 million of funding authority that will provide funding for the systems contract that um, Jim just spoke of, as well as continued construction activity on the civil contract and funding other project office um, related expenditures, including our third party agreements as well. And as I mentioned, this agreement, the amendment would, would bring us through early 2020, March of 2020, so we hope to have the full funding grant agreement at that time, at which point our funding would be predominantly provided by the full funding grant agreement and we would enter into a new agreement with Hennepin County at that time. So the recommendation before you today is to authorize the negotiation and execution of the First Amendment to the Hennepin County and Hennepin County Regional Rail Capital Grant Agreement for the limited notice to proceed period to add 118.6 million for a total of 553.5 million to fund SWLRT project-related activities through March of next year. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the presenter? All right. If not, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2019-179 Southwest Light Rail Transit First Amendment to the Hennepin County and Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority Capital Grants Agreement. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Any yeah. other discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And item is approved. Next, we're on to 2019-183. All right, Madam Chair, I'll cover this one. So this uh, is back for South <coughs> Corporation. Um, this is the existing uh, uh, relationship out there with the existing structure. There's a 920 or so parking stall uh, a ramp there that's owned by Southwest Transit. That will remain. Uh, what you see to the left of that is a is a, is is where the buses come in to pull in to pick up their customers and an office building. Uh, those those pieces will be removed as part of the construction we'll be doing and will essentially occupy that space with a new um, uh, station that will accommodate both bus and uh, light rail. And here are some images of what that's going to look like. Up in the upper left, you can get a glimpse of that. Uh, there's about a 450 stall uh, ramp that will be will be building. It's going to be essentially on top of the of the station platform. You can see in the lower left there, where you have the bus on the left side and LRT on the right. Get another image of that uh, uh, looking uh, you know, a little bit back in the in the foreground with that uh, at that lower right there, seeing how the how the buses come in and the LRT. LRVs come in there as well in a nighttime view on the upper right. So we've been in negotiations with uh, Southwest Transit for quite some time about this whole endeavor, and uh, we have a property agreement that uh, that says that we'll entertain, we'll get into an operations maintenance agreement, and so that's what we've been working on with Southwest Transit recently. Uh, this will define the operational maintenance roles. It's very important because we'll have, as you can see, we'll have LRT and bus uh, um, cohabitating in there. So we have to have re responsibilities delineated pretty, pretty carefully here. Uh, essentially, under this uh, O&M agreement, uh, the council would be responsible for the operation, maintenance, and capital replacement of all LRT facilities. And Southwest Transit would be responsible for the operation, maintenance, and capital replacement of all bus uh, facilities. There are some shared facilities here, obviously the platform, there's snow removal as well, where there's going to be a be a, a shared cost to maintain the, the elements that are, uh, that are shared by both uh, bus and rail. So Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, the recommendation is that the Met Council authorize the Regional Administrator to negotiate and execute an operations and maintenance agreement with Southwest Transit related to the Southwest Station. Any questions for the presenters? All right, if not, then I would entertain a motion for business item 2019-183, Southwest Light Rail Transit Operations and Maintenance Agreement for Southwest Station. So moved. Motion, is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And the item passes. On to the last Southwest one. All right, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, this is 2019-186 uh, uh, TCW, our agreement for flagging services. Uh, you may re may recall that uh, we did bring an item uh, emergency declaration to you all, and I'll be talking about that in a minute in, related to this uh, this uh, this uh, um, entity here. So, Council acquired the uh, the Kenilworth. Sorry, Council acquired the Kenilworth and Bass Lake Spur freight corridors uh, for the project. I'll show a map of that in a moment. TCNW uh, operates uh, overhead freight service over these uh, or these corridors, and uh, construction of the Southwest LRT requires their freight rail flaggers uh, are 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 going to be in place to notify construction workers of approaching freight trains. They essentially act as the communication between construction workers' activity and the and the trains that are coming through the work area. Flagging is a uh, requirement by the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration. And here's a map uh, showing that I've uh, sh so shown similar in the past. So essentially that green is uh, the Bass Lake Spur on the on the left and the Kenilworth Corridor on the right. And essentially that's where TCNW operates through a construction area where we're talking about tonight for the flagging. Uh, essentially where it's going to be effective is where you see the, the lighter green line where Southwest uh, Transit goes across the Bass Lake Spur and then around about downtown Hopkins and runs alongside all the way up to Bryn Mawr Station. So the agreement that uh, we're talking about kind of lifts off a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a council issued emergency declaration that was 2019-178 uh, to execute a bridge contract in June with uh, TCWR to provide flagging services in the short term. 
And uh, during that time, we've been working with TCW to, uh, to develop a longer term agreement. And, uh, and so that's what I'm here for tonight. Essentially, this will provide up to eight uh, full-time flaggers if needed. And I wanna emphasize that because this is all based on actual hours that are, uh, that are expended that we would pay for. And so we wanna have enough in the contract to be able to accommodate that. And this will go into the systems contract as well. So, so we need to have them, have them available for construction uh, until we get into revenue service. And uh, so the, uh, the recommendation here is the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute an agreement for flagging services related to the Southwest LRT um, uh, project with TCNWR, TCWR in the amount not to exceed 9.5 million. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can't remember how all these pieces fit together here, but um, there must have been, there was a flagging contract that budgeted in the original budget, correct? And then this, we changed up to go to TCNW flagging, correct? And the, so this nine million, nine and a half million is in addition to what was in the original budget for flagging? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member, maybe if I could clarify a little bit. Uh, so this emerging de declaration came about because there were some safety issues that, that occurred. And so I came to you all to seek this uh, declaration to be put in place. And, uh, and uh, so we were very concerned, FRA was concerned. And so we had to change gears. What their existing situation was is, uh, is LMJB had in their contract to handle the flagging. Mm -hmm. And uh, we determined that that was, uh, uh, there were safety concerns with that approach. And there was a, there was a, a line item budget for that, I think uh, 3 million um, uh, allocation that the contractor could draw from to do that work. And, uh, and so since then, we've decided to go uh, longer term with TCNW, again, handling the systems contract as well. And I would say that the $9.5 million is within our budget. It's not necessarily what had been programmed for LM LMJV and the civil contract, because this grows much bigger and covers the systems as well. Council Member Cummings. Thank you. I, I guess we're a little bit confused to so that the three million that was in the original budget for LMJV to do the flagging, hire the flaggers, whatever, is that three million, did that get spent? Is that being transferred to the agreement with TCNW so that the total contract for flagging is 12 million? Or uh, how does that lay out? Yes, Madam Chair, Council Member, some of that money of that uh, three million has been spent. I don't have a full accounting on that because that uh, that's that's being closed between uh, us and LMJV to determine what that final number is. But some monies have been, so it would be on top of that uh, nine point five. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2019-186 Southwest Light Rail Transit TCWR flagging agreement. So moved. Is there a second? Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Next we are on to item uh, business item 2019-201. We have a <coughs> big break. And this relates to Metro Transit Police Department <coughs> fleet purchase. <coughs> oh, and Jody Jacoby, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. Um, here to discuss business item uh, 19201, which is the uh, procurement of uh, goods and services uh, over 500,000, which is uh, essentially the purchase of 11 fleet vehicles or squad cars for our, our department. Um, a little bit of background uh, regarding this project. Uh, it initially uh, started out as two separate procurements, but at the request of our procurement department has been combined into one. And uh, it's got two main pieces. Uh, the first piece is an expansion of our fleet. Um, it goes in uh, line with uh, the sea line expansion. Um, those officers have been hired. They're on staff, they're on board working for us right now. And these six vehicles will give them a dedicated vehicle to drive uh, well assigned to the sea line. Uh, the second uh, piece to it is the purchase and replace of five uh, fleet vehicles or squad cars that have essentially uh, reached the end of their useful life. 
and uh, age, approximately half of this procurement uh, will be uh, for the fleet vehicle itself. Uh, the remaining half will be for the emergency equipment, the emergency lights, uh, technology, computers, and those types of things that are inside the squad cars, on, uh, as well as the installation of those items. Um, I know Jody had a few comments she wanted to make as far as the uh, procurement and uh, the state contract. Mm -hmm. So, Madam Chair, committee members, Jody Jacoby, I'm the procurement director. And as the lieutenant mentioned, 11 of the vehicles are being purchased from the state of Minnesota Cooperative Procurement Venture. And the state uh, has some procurements that agencies like the Met Council and local governments that can uh, uh, participate in because they can leverage much better pricing because of the volume purchasing. And so this is just one of the contracts that we're utilizing to get very attractive pricing. And procurement staff did go out and shop the market and again found that the cooperative procurement venture is the best value for this project. And as a lieutenant also mentioned, uh, the vehicles are only a portion of this request. The other portion is going to be emergency equipment to outfit the vehicle. And that equipment will be also purchased from a cooperative procurement venture. And then the installation will be quoted individually. All right, any questions? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what is the fate of the vehicles when they reach their useful, the end of their useful life? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, the fate is of those vehicles get turned back into our overhaul base and then sold at the uh, state auction. Thank you. Council Member Sterner? Um, just was wondering on the, the vehicles. I just uh, was listening to something like New York City went to hybrid vehicles made by Ford and they were saving 1,500 gallons per car per year. I don't know if you're Look at those vehicles on an ongoing basis. Are those something that Metropolitan Council will be looking at either in future purchases? Yeah, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, this uh, procurement will involve uh, one hybrid vehicle. It's kind of a pilot for us. It'll be uh, one of our unmarked cars, and it'll be an electric vehicle assigned to our investigative division. So it'll be the first hybrid car that the, that the police department's had. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, Council Member Fredson. Thanks, Chair. I just want to confirm the vehicles will be American made. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, yeah, there'll be a Ford Explorer. Thank you. All right, additional questions? All right, if not, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2019-201, uh, fleet purchase for Metro Transit Police Department. So moved. A motion, second. second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we are on to business item 2019-205, a joint it's, item. It's, it's a 2019 special capital budget amendment, and we have Ed Petrie. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, community members. Ed Petrie, Director of Finance, Metro Transit. I have with me this evening. Robert Rimstead, uh, Lead Project Manager in the Engineering Facilities Group. Uh, as the Chair mentioned, we do have a... Uh, business item number 2019-205-JT, uh, it's a 2019 special capital amendment, special capital budget amendment that we're bringing forward this evening. We're getting, there's two, th two items on the amendment. First of all, changes for the Southwest Project and also changes on the new Minneapolis bus garage. And I thought we'd start the presentation or start the amendment out this evening. First of all, uh, Robert does have, have a small presentation on the Minneapolis bus, bus garage. Chair and council members, so I'm just going to give a quick, a brief introduction on the project so that you have a little bit more background. And we anticipate bringing more de details with an upcoming business item to eventually award the construction contract for this project. So I'm going to start with kind of the, the need for the garage. So why do we need a six bus garage to operate our service? So currently, of the five service, uh, five operating garages we have in service, we put about 750 to 800 buses out on the street during every a.m. and p.m. rush. And so if you can imagine um, having those buses outside and then going out in the winter morning and trying to scrape the snow off and clear the ice off of 800 plus buses and still get those buses out on the streets to pick up our customers and maintain the high level of service and on-time performance they expect, uh, we'd be really challenged with that. So that's partially why we do have all of our buses 
parked indoors. And so here I have a chart that shows the the overall fleet size and our garage capacity. And I'm going to kind of walk through this here with the light blue on the bottom is our current um, uh, regular route service. The green is, well, as we project into the future, the A, A B, or T lines. So some of the first green that's coming out is the A line and the C line. And then as we start to move to the D, B, and those, the future letters for the BRT service, we see our regular routes going down with the ABRT is going up, and then the red are the ex additional expansion lines, such as the orange line and the gold line coming in. And then the purple at the very top is the service improvement plan. Those are uh, you know, future unfunded planned improvements to the system to further accommodate our the growth in the region. So starting at the bottom here, this yellow line that came across the screen, that's, that's where our existing garages, the five that operate, were designed to have that number of buses in them. So we're currently over capacity at our garages. This next dash deal line that comes in is kind of how many buses we have at that. So right now we're at the point where we've exceeded the capacity and even the crush capacity where we're parking uh, buses outside, we're parking them overnight. We're really struggling with some of those things to maintain that service throughout the day. So part of like kind of have an analogy that as if you think about if you have a two car household with a two car garage and you can't park in the street by it, but then you get a third vehicle and now you're parking that vehicle behind the other two in the front of it and you're starting to try to jockey them around. I mean, that's the situation we're currently in as we try to get the buses out on the street. As I was leaving the Haywood garage today, there's three or four pullout buses kind of backed up in the garage ready to get out and meet their pullout time. And they just weren't able to get around one bus that was on the way because there's so many other buses there. So it was kind of one of those ones where hopefully we had enough time built in the schedule for them to get their time point uh, and start that route on time. This next red line is the capacity that this new service garage will add to it so it'll relieve some of that crush capacity of the existing garages and allow for that future growth. And then the dash line is if we actually brought that all the way up to, you know, even as we're going through the design process, I can tell the maintenance staff, we're like, where else can we sneak a few more buses for once we get into the future years? So an overall project description. So this project consists of building a whole brand new uh, bus storage and maintenance facility with space for the 216 buses I mentioned. Um, it has space for the preventive maintenance and minor repair. So it has 24 maintenance bays to do a lot of the service checks, uh, changing the oil tires, fueling, washing, um, checking out the buses that come with the, uh, you know, making sure the ramps work, the doors, everything <coughs> to get that bus so it's operating as our customers expect. Uh, it provides the check-in space for our administrative staff and then for the operators and maintainers to come in and, and perform their work. Um, overall, there will be, it, when, when the garage is at full capacity, it'll provide up to 400 living wage jobs. And then during construction, it'll be about 300 jobs. So it'll be located at a site just north and west of the existing Haywood garage. Um, you can fly through here. Here's the existing Haywood office and police building <clears throat> called out. The existing Haywood garage is that large blue black letter F. And then A is that is that new site. Um, so some of the benefits of having the garage at this location is it's central to a lot of our core service region of downtown Minneapolis. Uh, it's an efficient departure. There's not, it really reduces our deadhead. Uh, and it's adjacent to other additional support spaces such as the other garage, the main offices and the transit control center. So looking at it through the Thrive lens analysis, uh, some of the things that we're doing in, the, in this project, um, late last year as we announced plans for uh, further electrification of the fleet, uh, we, the design, um, the bringing in the electrical infrastructure to support up to 100 electric buses. And so this will bring in up to eight megawatts of power um, to eventually add in chargers as we continue to add electric buses to the fleet and then plans to include it up to a fully electric garage uh, in the future as additional electric buses are added to the fleet. Um, on the south side of the building, we're using a solar thermal wall. So we had metal panels on the building. Um, said, well, if we're putting up a metal panel, why don't we put up this perforated metal panel that helps to heat some outside air, bring it in in the wintertime, that reduces our heating um, demand by about 10%. Uh, we're capturing some of the rainwater on, off the roof and using that in some of the first cycle of the bus wash. This will be one of our most energy efficient buildings at less than 50 kbu 2 per square foot per year. Uh, that's kind of like a miles per gallon per car, the lower the better. Uh, most of our other facilities are around the 80 range, so this is quite a significant drop in that. Uh, with the, with the equity piece, we're planning on expanding that uh, maintenance technician program to continue to train additional mechanics. 
and then the having the space to support our new transit development, such as the C line, D line, Orange line, Bow line, to support that service expansion, kind of goes into the next piece of the livability, is that by increasing the accessibility throughout the city by having the bus service, we're able to get everybody to their jobs, education, and, and healthcare, and other places that people need to get on public transit. So the overall budget uh, for the project on the left is shown um, as to what we've spent money on for land purchases, uh, management, the design contract, site prep uh, to demolish some of the buildings that used to be on the site, uh, the construction cost, the anticipated construction cost with change order funds included in that, and then some of the equipment that such as the bus lifts and the bus wash and other things that go into making that garage work. Um, the funding on the right is uh, what is local funding at 85 million, the federal formula funds we were projecting to use. Um, we did receive two competitive grant applications through the CMAC award and then the federal uh, bus facility grant in, in 2018 for the garage. Okay, take a quick pause. I know council members Aaron uh, has a question. There, there are two things that really get me excited and one is electric buses and the other one is solar. And if we go back to uh, slide four, uh, future rooftop solar array. Could you explain a little bit ar around that? Uh, how big of, a, of a, an array are we talking about? What's the time frame after construction that that would go in? So we've, uh, in the design of the structural design, we've designed the structure to support it and we have conduits going up to the roof to tie down. Uh, we projected that we may go up to, have a space to go up to two megawatts of solar on the roof um, to support uh, the, the needs of the building with, with electric buses, it's, it's a lot of electricity. So this will be at least a small piece to help that out. Um, we do have some, uh, another grant that we recently competed for was the NOLO grant. So about two weeks ago, it was announced that we had some renewable energy money in the budget and we're looking at applying that to this facility. And um, we're recently, awarded a two and a half million dollar federal grant to go to contribute towards that project to get uh, the solar, uh, some battery uh, backup, and then two quick charges so that if a bus is in the maintenance area, we'll be able to, um, as it finishes its maintenance cycle, give it a quick charger, an overhead charge that can charge at a faster rate than the typical depot chargers and get it out on the street. So it's a combination of those three, and that's about a $8 million to add to the projects. And so I think as we continue through the budgeting process, we still need to come up with the funding to get that full package together. But between some existing funding that we have for renewable energy and that federal grant, um, we'll be working on that. So with the, the facilities projected to open in 2022, so we're trying to make sure that we have the plans in place to um, get that to happen at the very end of the project in 22 or 23, and kind of as it really just continue into that that piece and add <clears throat> electrical infrastructure for the buses. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions? Council Member Ferguson. So am I reading your, I'm just looking at the graph on page two, maybe it was. So are we saying when this opens in 2022, we'll already be over capacity and by 2028, we'll be over crush capacity? So the, the purple area at the top is, um, what's called, uh, it's in the service improvement plan. And these are all plans plans that our service development department goes through and um, projects, these are areas that are good areas to add bus service to, but they're unfunded. So the area in the purple is if we had all of the funding and we could make these improvements, that's where we um, would make them and implement them. But the, the purple is unfunded and we don't know when it will be funded. Um, pretty much everything at the red is, um, what we have kind of planned in, 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 the, in, in the short, kind of the, the growth plan that we're projecting now, but if there's a large infusion in public transit, then the purple would then be, um, then we would start to get into that purple area. So when we do open the garage, we don't anticipate being at that capacity or, or shortly after getting into crush capacity. And then we also are working on long range plans to what happens when we get above that dashed red line. You know, where does that next expansion occur to add capacity for another 60 buses? Another question? Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, we have we have facilities uh, throughout the region. You know that we have currently five facilities, so we'll have this will be our sixth facility. We review these over time, in terms of uh, 
uh, what's required to keep up with demand. I think uh, we, we are we are looking at a long-term capital budget plan now, take us through, through 2020, but that is, will be part of that review. And these sort of considerations about what we can expect, what's funded and what's not funded, are part of, part of that review. And that comes to you in the form of a, of a capital budget uh, eventually. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question on slide three, uh, in which uh, there's the mention of 400 plus living wage jobs. Is are those going to be new positions created or transfer positions um, for staff? I think as as oh, chair council members. Um, so those jobs uh, is kind of based on the number of buses that could be at that garage and what our current staffing is for garages of that size. So um, our Halo garage and our East Metro garage are of similar size and bus counts and they have about that many employees at them. So initially, as this garage opens up, some of those positions will be shifted around as we get our capacity balanced across all the facilities. And then as that expansion of the bus fleet occurs, then we'll continue to add those positions over time. So it's at the opening date, we won't be adding 400 new jobs. It'll be kind of reshuffling people around within the different service garages um, throughout their, their pick process. And then as we continue to add buses to the fleet over time, then additional jobs will come with that. All right, thank you. All right, any additional questions for Mr. Hempstead? Uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. I don't know, thank you, Chair, if you have any idea about this but it's come up recently in a few conversations that I've um, been asked about. And when we have the opportunity to create green spaces, are, do we have like a ph philosophy around, are we using sustainable planting landscaping? I know that this is for illustrative purposes, but mowed lawns are apparently the new bad thing, um, environmentally speaking. So I'm just curious, what are we doing for our pollinator friends and other things? Is that something that we have a policy about or a value statement for or a plan for? Chair and council members, uh, a few years ago, uh, one of our staff members helped us prepare kind of our landscape plan and program. <laughs> And uh, some of the pieces that we've adopted from that for this project is uh, we do have some low mow grass in here in, in the, uh, around the site. So we're reducing the amount that we have to mow. Uh, we've tested that out a few sites and had some mixed results that we're still trying to kind of work through and understand how to best um, use that planting. Uh, we have a good mix of, of trees around the site you know, for the city of Minneapolis requirements as to make sure that if you know, Dutch elm disease comes through, they're not wiping out all the trees. Um, on the northwest side of the site, we have a lot of green space that is going to be kind of set up for future expansion of other support facilities over time. And back there, we're using a lot of native plantings. So it'll be more of the native grasses and pollinator type uh, seed mixes so that we're not, we're just able to let that area grow. We don't have to mow it and then it will provide that um, habitat for those pollinators. And just a comment, um, I just know when I look at what we've done with the police station and we should, uh, as we move back over towards Haywood, um, get another tour over there. Um, they've done, uh, what they've done for um, environmental concerns and sustainability will be quite impressive. And I think that, you know, this is factoring and in, building into that entire campus. And so that's a good opportunity to show some of sort of the uh, real intentional thought that was put into it by the last council. Cause there was some conversation about it, especially with some of our station designs and that type of thing. And so I wouldn't say there's a specific policy, but on each project it does get considered in some way, shape or form, but it'll be good to get you all out to the police station. When, when we can get there with parking. We're getting there. It's almost there. Council Member Atlas and Gretzen. So thanks for that. I appreciate hearing hearing about that. I um, I I do think that there's you know increasing value for us to look at um, all the opportunities we have to um, support um, species diversity mm -hmm. within our communities, particularly in this area. It's quickly becoming an area that's you know covered by concrete um, so significantly. And so I just think where we have small opportunities to um, keep making sure that water has an opportunity to get into our um, groundwater system and to 
permeate the concrete all around. But in addition to that, livability is not, you know, lost on me. This part of, this is kind of the gateway from North Minneapolis into downtown. And it's not a very pleasant walk compared to almost every other entry into downtown. And so I just think of the opportunity we have to um, encourage people to use transit and to bike and walk um, through having design that's pedestrian friendly and at a pedestrian scale, but also we can do those things and, and, and make sure our footprint is, is good. So I would just be a fan of that. I know we're looking at what we can do as a council proactively around policies on this front. So I'll, this, this one I'm gonna add in to where we have our facilities, what we're choosing to do. Okay, any other questions? All right, turn it over to Ed for the, the budget items. Okay, thank the you. Budget amendment. Uh, Chair. <laughs> so now we go to the portion of the, the amendment to bring in the funds. Uh, once again, this is the 2019 Special Capital Budget Amendment. We have two adjustments that we're recommending for a, a adjustment to the uh, capital budget this evening. The first item is for the Southwest Light Rail Project, number 61001. Uh, this amendment follows the business item that was presented a few minutes ago by Joan Hollick. Uh, in regards to the Hennepin County First Amendment to their to the grant agreements. It'll recognize $94.8 million in Hennepin County funding and $23.7 million in HICRA funding for the no, limited notice to proceed to take us through March of 2020. So this is consistent with uh, business item number 2019-179 uh, just presented. Uh, the second adjustment is for the Haywood expansion or the new Minneapolis bus garage. It is in line with the budget that Robert uh, just presented for the new Minneapolis bus garage. It will recognize and provide $10.1 million for the construction of the garage. Uh, this money is coming from a, a, a four, basically four different sources. Uh, we have a couple projects that are uh, currently don't need the current scope that they have within them. They can be reduced down, so we're uh, pulling in $110,000 from those projects. Uh, we have a number of projects, about eight or 10 projects that are now completed, ready to close. And they have uh, about $1.4 million of RTC local funds left in them. So we're gonna transfer those into the bus garage. Uh, we have $7.4 million of available RTC that has not been encumbered into any projects. That's still in our balance. That will now go into this bus garage. And then we have uh, four different projects uh, equaling $1.2 million that were planned in our 2019 CIP that are no longer gonna move forward. They're not necessary. Project managers say they're not ready to go with these projects. So we will use those available funds for the Minneapolis bus garage. Those four combinations bring us to the $10.1 million for the construction of the new Minneapolis bus garage. And Madam Chair, the action then this evening would be that the Metropolitan Council authorize the 2019 unified budget as indicated in accordance with the attached tables. And I would stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Petrie? All right, if not, then I would entertain a motion to approve a uh, business item 2019 uh, 205 JT, the 2019 Special Capital Budget Amendment. So moved. Second. Uh, motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next, we move Thank on you. to business item. Thank you, gentlemen. 2019 uh, 220. Master Contracts for Electric Technology Based Project Design and, con and Construction Support Services. We have Julie Brenny and Jody Jacoby. Madam Chair and committee members, I'm Julie Brenny. I'm with Metro Transit Engineering and Facilities, and I'm presenting business item 2019 220. This is for Master Contracts for Electronic Technology Based Projects Design and Construction Support Services, contract number 19. 19P038. We have a slide that in pictures kind of shows what electronic technology projects encompass. You can see real time signs, transit customer information systems, and then the gizmo on the right is an M track transit signal priority piece of equipment. Um, Metro Transit has utilized master contracts for engineering and design services since 2001. This procurement will replace four existing contracts which expire at the end of the year and will have been fully expended. The contracts are used by staff for a wide range of capital and operating projects and funding for the work is provided within those projects. These are on-call contracts 
we're not committed to spending the money until we have a project to utilize um, the contract. The contracts are also utilized by other divisions of the organization, primarily our bus operations technology staff. And projects completed within this scope of work are as I've got on, this, on the slide here, and then also encompass things such as the bus operations pedestrian and cyc cyclist awareness notification system known as PECONS, intelligent transportation systems, and integrated corridor management. Um, I would just like to focus on a couple of these initiatives, the first being transit signal priority, also known as TSP. This is an initiative for promoting speed and reliability on heavily used routes. Um, we've worked recently on Route 5, Route 2, and Route 54. Um, the engineering firm hired may evaluate the potential TSP benefit, determine timing parameters, and vet that information with responsible signal operating agencies, fine tune things, and then eventually design the implementation. The second project I'd like to highlight is the Pedestrian and Cyclist Awareness Notification System, PECONS. The current work that is underway um, centers around evaluating several alternatives and determining whether a system that is available is technically, economically, and operationally viable for Metro Transit. And this would be a system for the operator to have a warning of pedestrians and cyclists in the area surrounding the bus. Um, next, Jody Jacoby will talk about the procurement process. Madam Chair, committee members, um, a little bit of information about the procurement process. This project was advertised on the Council's Doing Business with the Council website on March 15th. We had 18 plan holders or firms that downloaded the project. The Office of Equal Opportunity did not set a DBE or MCUB goal on this project because of the very specialized work. However, the Office of Equal Opportunity, the business unit and procurement did specifically outreach to any known MCUB and DBE vendor who may have some interest in the project. Procurement facilitated a pre-proposal meeting to help the vendors understand more about the process, the procurement process, and then learn about the project. On April 18th, eight proposals were received and they were evaluated against the criteria that was published in the request for proposal on quality, qualifications, experience, service delivery plan, key personnel, and the qualifications of the subcontractors. This was a Brooks Act procurement, so it was a two-step, and the first step is to technically rank the proposals, and then the second step is for to negotiate cost. The group, the evaluation panel, uh, evaluated individually and then as a group, and after a group uh, evaluation, they reached consensus that the five highest rated firms, HDR Inc., Alliant Engineering, SRF Consulting, Kimley Horn and Associates, and AECOM represent the best value for the council. Two of those firms, even though there was no DBE or MCUB firm, are subcontracting directly with DBE subcontractors. SRF is subcontracting to Transmart Technologies and Kimley Horn with MP Consultants. And the recommendation is to contract with, again, these each firms for a contract value not to exceed $250,000. So in summary, we're requesting authorization to award five contracts at $250,000 each for a total of $1,250,000 for a term of five years. Any questions? Um, I'd say maybe, Jody, if you just want to talk a little bit about why we have master contracts and why they're um, important in this kind of work that we're doing. Madam Chair, committee members, I'm actually going to let Julie Brenny talk about that with the business needs for master contracts. Madam Chair and committee members, um, 
within engineering and facilities, projects that would fall under these contracts could range from a $5,000 work order to we generally try to limit them to $50,000. So there's a kind of a wide range of dollar value in those work orders. Um, the master contracts allow us to be a little more nimble as far as keeping our workflow moving. Um, we've already gone through the process and selected vendors so that we can keep our workflow moving. We, at any given time, we have probably 250 projects moving through our department with, um, I think we have somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 project managers who are managing that work. So if you do the math, each project manager is managing a large number of projects. Um, if we were to procure every single project individually, it would add a lot of time and work to their workload to manage all the work that they are carrying forward on any given day. Okay. Right. Are there any other questions for the presenters? All right, if not, I would entertain a motion um, to approve business item 2019-220, Master Contracts for Electronic Technology-Based Projects Design and Construction Support Services. So moved. A motion, is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Thank you, Wayne. All right, next we have item 2019-222, which is the same week item. Uh, we have Brian Funk here to talk about Operator Apprentice Grant Agreement. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, again, I'm Brian Funk. I'm the Deputy Chief Operating Officer for BUS at Metro Transit. Uh, today, I'm bringing forward a business item as indicated, 2019-222. It's a same week item. Uh, what this business item does is really it authorizes an amendment to an existing grant. Um, in 2019, or 2018, excuse me, uh, we started our Operator Apprenticeship Program, which I reviewed at a Committee of the Whole meeting a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. This program allows newly hired bus operators to be paired with existing <clears throat> bus operators for a mentorship period of at least their first year uh, when they start that position. Provides uh, excellent skill-based training, a peer-to-peer -peer relationship that's invaluable, um, and builds on their professional network from their start. Uh, to date, we've had more than 120 newly hired bus operators begin that program. We'll be celebrating uh, our first graduates in the month of October. We're looking forward to planning a celebration that uh, you all will be invited to attend. Uh, what this grant amendment will do is build on Metro 2018 MAI with the state of Minnesota through DEED to authorize up to $500,000 in additional reimbursable expense funding. And so, uh, what we're seeking is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to execute the grant amendment. And again, it'll authorize uh, the council to receive up to $500,000 for reimbursable expenses, primarily in the area of training. With that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the presenter? Uh, Councilmember Zarin. Uh, do we provide, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, do we provide the graduate uh, a certificate that is a credential that they can hang on the wall and be proud of? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, absolutely. So uh, we had a meeting last week where we started that planning effort to make sure that uh, we do recognize the individuals with the certificate, the card that they're able to carry. Uh, this is a registered apprenticeship program through the state of Minnesota. Uh, it's the first transit coach operator apprenticeship in the state, uh, it's second in the nation. And so uh, we're going to make this a really big deal for all of our graduates. It's important for not just the folks who are apprentices, but also for the mentors um, and a partnership, you know, a really great partnership between uh, the union and the company. Follow up question, if I may. Of course. Um, now that credential is transfer, is that credential transferable? Are there any other uh, bus operations that are looking at um, doing the same? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, my understanding is that uh, because we are sort of the, the leading edge of this, uh, that it's going to be primarily something that if somebody were to take that credential to another organization, they're going to probably be the first one in the door. Uh, aside from Metro Transit, uh, VTA in San Jose uh, is really the other organization for the transit coach operator position that has the recognized apprenticeship. 
But in working with uh, Transportation Learning Center, uh, we're hoping that this model starts to evolve into something that can be applied across the country. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Councilmember Atlas and Gretzen? Thank you, Chair. Um, wondering what are we doing to address issues of retention, um, especially when we're investing in this Great kind of question. a way? Right. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Council Members, so uh, this is one of the ways that we're working on retention. Uh, what our evaluations have shown, and especially recently, is that um, employees who uh, are less likely to be successful and stay with the organization um, don't make it through their first or second year. And so this first year we recognize is critical for establishing that relationship who um, can make the best use of both the programs that we have, but also that peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Uh, in addition, uh, we have what's called an enhanced probationary period. So your first six months on the job, we have touchstones for uh, ride-alongs from instructors, supervisor meetups that are planned, um, that sort of relationship building as well, so people understand what are the access to um, to the on-the-job resources. Uh, for all of our operators, we've started a what's called a Red Kite uh, training program that's focused on resiliency and de-escalation training through an organization uh, that's partnered with SEPTA uh, in the Philadelphia area in transit. And so that's sort of a, looking at the job as a human services type position. And you know, when you're a bus operator, a train operator, you're going through a lot on the streets. And so building up your resiliency and your ability to handle stress is one of the key factors. And so um, I could keep going, but that's sort of illustrative of the, the different efforts that we're making to try to make sure that as people come in and they make an investment in us, we're also making an investment in them to make sure they have the support network uh, internally, in addition to all of the other training that goes on, uh, annual training in the form of professional development, uh, access to things like a leadership academy program that gives you uh, six months of on-the-job experience in managerial or supervisory positions that qualifies and substitutes for uh, a year of required supervisory experience in some of the other jobs. And so trying to make use of uh, what are all the things we can do for our current employees to keep them as well. Okay. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I think this program is great. I think mentoring programs are just really, really an effective way to both bring in and then retain uh, employees. I'm curious, and I know that this is very new, but of the 120 newly hired coming up on almost a year, how many do we still have out of the 120? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, so um, I'm going by memory, which is still pretty good, but uh, maybe not quite perfect. So if I'm wrong, I'll report back out. But so the 120 recognizes uh, people who registered into the program. It's voluntary. Not all, but nearly all new hires since last October have uh, signed up for this. We've had a couple who have self-selected out. Um, we've had about 20 or so, 25, uh, who did not complete their training period. Um, and then another 15 or so who have left the organization either voluntarily or involuntarily. So we're sitting at about 85 active uh, participants right now. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? Council Member Atlas and Gretzen. Thank you. How does that compare to previous classes? If you have a comparison. Yep. Uh, so, Madam Chair and Council Member, uh, so we are seeing a nice uptick in the retention uh, of new people coming in. That initial training period, the primary reason why uh, new hires have not been successful is related to obtaining a commercial driver's license, uh, which is really a pass fail marker. And so, we're also looking at solving that um, through our training and, and studying beforehand. But um, after that, we are seeing a little bit better retention. We're not comparing exactly the same just because, of course, there's unique individuals, but also we've had a higher percentage of hires without prior commercial driving experience uh, in the last year, two years. And so that skewed uh, a little bit the success rate, uh, that it's a little bit less favorable than it had been. But again, we're targeting and training, responding with our training to compensate for that, to try to provide people with the best opportunity for success. Okay. Any additional questions? I just make a comment that um, I love our apprenticeship and training programs, and uh, I really like it when we get to be the one setting a good example for everybody else. So, um, thank you. So, with that, um, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve item business item twenty nineteen two 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 same week. 
So moved. The motion is our second. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, deciding what goes on to consent, um, I believe that items uh, three, four, five, seven and eight can go on consent. So that would leave the first two Southwest ones. Oh, sorry, it's the same week item. So it would be three, four, five, and seven. Everyone, on the bigger Southwest, the budget item and the same week item would have to go over. Okay, good. All right, next we are on to information items. So um, uh, we have Ed and Heather back to join us to finish the budget discussion. As we talked last time, you got to see that we have some serious budget constraints. And now you also get to see now what we hope to do and plan to do uh, for the 2020 operating budget. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. Once again, Ed Petrie, Director of Finance, Metro Transit. And Heather Augustin Hebner, Director of Finance for MTS. We're here to present Part B of the 2020 budget. Uh, for the transportation division, I will just jump in and start the process here. First of all, with our budget objectives, with setting the 2020 budget uh, or proposing 2020 budget, uh, our budget does support uh, support Thrive MSP 2040. Uh, it supports um, the Thrive lens through improvability, sustainability, and prosperity by growing ridership. It supports equity by meeting needs across the region. It demonstrates our financial stewardship by constructing a balanced transit budget. And also, as we discussed uh, two weeks ago, we also look do a financial outlook where we're also looking at current year operations and the next four years. Uh, and also our budget does prioritize our, any structural solutions with a multi-year forecast. As I mentioned, a five-year five -year look at everything. We minimize the impact on council levies and we maintain reserves at the council policy levels. Overall, with our budget framework, uh, as, as we discussed a couple weeks ago, first of all, there are some basis that developed our budget or are helping develop, develop our budget in 2020. First of all, there's a number of actions that the Metropolitan Council has taken and number of policies and actions that, that the council has approved, whether it's on fair policy, whether it's on our, our service plans and the old service on the street based upon the transportation policy plan, or whether it's approval of all our various labor contracts or contracted service contracts. Uh, there's also legislative action that we did talk about a couple weeks ago, whether it's setting the motor vehicle sales tax. We get the forecast from the state of Minnesota twice a year. Uh, we, we use that to base our uh, motor vehicle sales tax revenue forecast in our budgets. We also have, through the legislature, we also have legislative state appropriations. So we use those amounts to go ahead and forecast into our budget. And the other basis for the budget is a multi-year forecast that that we, we, we talked about. One of the things that we look at is we look at not only our current year operations, we will then forecast for the next two bienniums out and look at how, our, how our, our expenses are trending, what we're seeing for trends for motor vehicle sales tax, contract expenses, all those types of items, and look to, to determine whether or not we have a structural balance over the next four years. If we don't, then we start making making suggestions, which we'd come back to the council to talk to the council about any potential suggestions that we'd have to we'd come back on. If we're seeing, let's say, a down, downturn in motor vehicle sales, or we're seeing some of our labor contracts potentially may go up or ridership goes soft, whatever the case would be, solutions we'd come back and talk to the council would be potential look at service, fare increases, or potentially going back to the legislature asking for additional funding, for example, state appropriations. So we not only look at, as I stated, not only look at the current year, but we'll look four years out. So we can really look at, we look ourselves at, at look at ourselves as a business and what a business would do over the next four years. Uh, we use all this information then to develop our annual budget, which is we're budgeting at our major revenue and expense categories. Uh, when we adopt the budget, it's not at a line item basis, but what we have Below all of the revenue and expense numbers, we do have the line item budget details by department, by line item, by by every one of the expense categories. Uh, some of the type parameters that we do have within the budget development, as we've talked about before, is motor vehicle sales tax. We get a motor vehicle sales tax forecast every every February and every November of every year. The budget numbers you're going to see this evening are based now upon the February 2019 motor vehicle sales tax. Before we bring the budget back for final adoption in December, we will receive a November forecast. So any changes that have occurred between February and November 
we'll come back to the council and inform you either motor vehicle sales tax went up or down and this is the adjustment we're going to make we would recommend making to the 2020 budgets before adoption uh, state appropriations as we talked about in the, at the last meeting this the state of minnesota made some changes with the state appropriations this past year they basically they took previously we always had the state appropriations for transit operations what the state of minnesota did this past legislative session they broke out a portion for metro mobility and they left a portion there for transit operations which is then covered through which is used to cover uh, light rail and commuter rail operations we no longer have any state appropriations covered in the bus operations bus operations is being covered by motor vehicle sales tax so then they also then gave us a one-time funding one-time additional money on state appropriations for metro mobility 23 million dollars in the for the first year or for, for the first yeah for the first year and a proposed 13 million dollars for the second year so an additional 36 million dollars over this biennial uh, what will happen though then is that the, the motor vehicle the state appropriations for metro mobility will then drop down to its base level base level for a metro mobility uh, light rail commuter rail is around 89 million dollars so in three years out it'll drop down to that base and move forward and we had talked about that at the last at the last uh, presentation the service on the street include includes all the service that's planned through the transportation policy plan through through all the performance standards on on uh, route performance uh, fare box recovery all those types of standards so we evaluate all our routes continually and look at which routes are performing and hitting the performance standards if they're not we always use the term harvest and reinvest We'll look at those routes and determine if it's not performing according to regional standards. Is there some other place we can then take that route, take the hours of service and the expense of that service and reinvest it into another area that either is experiencing overloads or we've had a request, request for additional service. So we continue to look, look at that within our budget frameworks. Uh, there's also a number of labor contracts that have come in that you've, the council has approved. That is the basis of the budget. Uh, there's going to be a metro mobility expansion to Lakeville that Heather will talk about when she gets into her portion of the budget. And as we talked about in our previous budget, there's a number of 2019 uh, customer improvements that are going to be annualized in the 20, uh, 2020 budget. Uh, some of the customer improvements, uh, these, these, they, these are initiatives that have been discussed with the council previously. Uh, one of the things that we do want to discuss with you or inform you is that many of these investments that are being put in are investments that... Uh, that are in areas where we do have potentially turnover with staff. So if there'd be some need as we're making these investments that we'd have to back out of the investment, let's say we have a dip in motor vehicle sales tax or something in coming forward. These are, these are going into investments in areas that we could back out after discussion with the council if we needed to back away from. Uh, one second, some, one pause, one second. Uh, council member Cummings have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, going back to the increase, 25 million, 13 million for the next two years, and you may not know this, but what's the thinking, the rationale behind that? I know that Metro Mobility is very expensive and it was losing money, um, uh, but the two numbers are very different, and, or was that supposed to be to, toward Lakeville, or what was the thinking about the 25 and then the 13, do you know? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, first of all, we had we had provided the legislature with a budget for the next biennium for the Metro Mobility, and we had laid out that we needed $36 million okay. during that period of time. So that was, that they parsed it out at the legislature for the 23 and the 13, but we had laid out the need of $36 million. Okay, thank you. Right. Madam Chair. Yep. Yeah, General I, Manager, I, I can't resist as you ask that question to mention that, that probably the, the, the biggest issue of providing us the funds that we requested for Metro Mobility to keep services as they were required is they only provide us one-time money for long-term need. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're suffering from. I, I, I'm always never going to resist a time to remind people of that. But that's what we're suffering from and facing our bus deficit as well, where the last appropriation we received was appropriation for something like $70 million in that neighborhood of the recognized need during that legislative session and then it was not continued in the in the in the next years and it creates a cliff for us so right. that's really the significance of what happened there and i agree i won't uh, miss an opportunity to remind people of that so um <laughs> any additional questions right now all right go ahead okay thank you madam chair so some so some of the uh 2019 uh, customer improvements that will annualize in 2020 that were uh, 
proposing would be first of all improving customer communications, which would be uh, improving customer departure information with our next version of our next trip software. Uh, it would be adding three additional staff to the transit control center to support the real time rider alerts for service departure changes, uh, some social media notifications and alerts, and text for safety. Uh, one of the big improvements that Mr. Koyster has talked about over the last few months is improving the conditions of our services and our facilities. Uh, adding of 16 staff to clean the trains and maintain our public facilities, both bus and rail. A con continued investment in ADA improvements and then a focus on our winter performance and our snow removal at our various, at our various sites. Uh, another an improvement is enhancing security on our trains and at our transit stations. It would be building on security enhancements made this year, enhancing LRT enforcement and patrol officer increased focus time on the trains and on the buses. So those are initiatives that we are starting in 2019 and would annualize into the 2020 budget. Uh, Council Member Atlas and Bretson. Um, I've um, become aware that, um, let me go back one slide, that around customer improvements, we've had a history of having um, uh, relationships with some of the youth serving organizations to help address youth, uh, youth experience and, and participation, particularly on the light rail and other bus lines. Are those continuing to be invested in? I know that just from my time at Minneapolis Public Schools, we worked with the youth coordinating board and the youth are here to address issues that were happening at the light rail station on Lake Street and Hiawatha was incredibly successful. Um, and, um, and then I, I believe that there's another organization that's been um, engaged in St. Paul um, that has been about youth, engaging youth. Um, and I believe the intent was to in increase customer um, improvement or quality of experience in addition to that. So I'm just curious if we're going to continue those kinds of programs going General manager? Madam Chair, I think you know more about this than I do right now. So I'm going to, okay. I'm going to look into it. <laughs> All and, right. And I'll get back to you on, on to that question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else will replies? All right. Back to you guys again. Okay. We're going to get through this tonight. I know we are. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, mitigating revenue and expense volatility, as any good finance person would do, we also look at, with our financial budgets, we also look at where we can mitigate <laughs> revenue and, and expense volatility. One of the things with motor vehicle sales tax, as we have talked about, is the council made the decision when the, when the council went on to the motor vehicle sales tax back in 2008 due to the volatility of that revenue source, we budget 95% of the state forecast. And it was a very conservative measure, but as time has shown us, there have been a few years where the, we've only received 95, 96, 97% of forecast. So it was a very good decision that the council made as of that point in time. So what we do is we budget 95% of the forecast. Anything that we receive in excess of that 95% then goes into a motor vehicle sales tax reserve, which will then be budgeted into the future year budget operations, which we get when we get to some of the budget size, I will point that out so you can see where the current year 95% is coming in and then where we're bringing in the portion that went to the reserves that we collected in excess of 95. Uh, fuel, fuel hedge pricing, fuel forward pricing. The council, we are the, the largest consumer of diesel fuel in the state of Minnesota. We consume about, consume about seven and a half million gallons of diesel fuel. So as you, as you can all, I would assume, appreciate the volatility of the fuel prices if something happens over in Iraq, whatever the case would be, fuel could go through the roof. So one of the things that the council made the decision was, was to fuel forward hedge our, our diesel fuel. What that means is we will price out, we will hedge out forward, price out contracts forward for up to 24 months, up to 90% 90, 90 of our volume. So we do that for budget certainty, certainty so we know what the price of diesel fuel is going to be for the next 24 months. We've locked that price in. Uh, operating fund reserve targets, that's one of the things we talked about at the, the last, uh, last meeting. We have within the transportation division a range of 8.3% up to 10% minimum reserves that the council has set for our transportation division. You know, as with any business, when you set reserves, they are good for one-time solutions, one-time fixes. It is not good for a structural balance. So you have a reserves available. With these reserves, it's basically, it's usually about one month's expenses we have in a reserve to help us in case something one-time 
happens. If it's a structural problem that helps us to find and then get ourselves to the structural solution. Okay, so now we'll start talking some numbers here. The overall transportation division budget, it's just over a $621 million budget. Uh, I'll go over the revenue side, slides on the right-hand side. First of all, motor vehicle sales tax. That's 43% of our budget. Now that represents the 95% of the forecast that we budgeted. And then you see then the other, down at the bottom, you see other funds transferred, $25.3 million. That is the portion that we collected in the prior year in excess of 95% that went into reserves that we're now bringing into the operation for this year. The balance of the revenue sources, we have state funds, which is the state appropriations, but that is from legislation. The federal funds of $37 million, that is federal funding that we're receiving to cover escrow CMAC and marketing activities, and also covering salaries of our, of our uh, operating staff that are working on capital projects, like the building of the new Minneapolis bus garage, for example. Uh, fares are in at $113 million, or 18%. That's based upon projected ridership and the council's fare policy. Uh, county contribution, you can see at $37 million, or 6%. That is the county contribution for the subsidy on the light rail and the commuter rail lines. Uh, use of reserve, that, that is a planned use of reserves. Uh, one of the things that we did talk about in the last meeting was, back in 2017, when we were looking at our structural deficit and looking at our for forecast for the next four years, the council saw and recognized that we did have a structural deficit coming. So back in 2017, the council purposely decided to start building reserves. As to be part of the solution, we knew we couldn't be the whole solution. And this was discussed with the governors, also discussed with the legislature, they were aware that we were building reserves as part of a fix to help us you know, get ourselves for moving forward. It's not the solution, but we purposely built the reserves. We're gonna be using the reserves as I talked about at the last meeting over the next couple of years. And as of 2022, we will be down to our minimum reserve levels. So this was a planned use of reserves of just under $20 million according to the overall plan. Uh, and then the other revenues of $6.9 million, that's mainly comprised of two components. It's advertising, income and interest income. Advertising income, you notice all of our trains and all of our buses that are wrapped. It's very lucrative for us. It brings in about six million, about six million of the six point nine million dollars is advertising income. So it's very lucrative for us. Just ex quick question. Councilmember Ferguson. So the other funds, is that all the five percent from last year? The other funds Chair, transfer. members. Yeah, the other funds transferred, that would be the motor vehicle sales tax reserve coming in. So that would indicate last year we had five hundred million in motor vehicle sales tax, and this year we're only expecting two hundred and sixty seven million. I guess I'm not following. Well, we 20, twenty five million if if that's the five percent from last year, right? Then the motor vehicle sales tax last year was about five hundred million. Right, where it looks like there's a huge drop in motor vehicle sales tax. Because this year the five percent would be only would be a lot less, right? The five percent that we would be reserving this year is only thirteen million or so. Uh, Madam Chair, Committee Members, first of all, this is five percent of our budget. Right. Of the okay. budget. Okay. So you're saving you so you reserve five percent of the budget, not motor vehicle sales tax. Madam Chair, Committee Members, we reserve anything in excess of ninety five percent of the collections of the forecast. Because we only budget 95% of the forecast of motor vehicle sales motor vehicle, tax. of the motor vehicle sales tax forecast from the state. Mm -hmm. Anything in excess of that, we put into the motor vehicle sales tax reserve. Those funds are then available in the next year's operations. So what we're doing then is we're pulling 25 million dollars from that reserve into this year's operations. It happens to be 4% of our operating budget for next year. Okay, so, so there was an overage. We got the four and the five, but mm -hmm. so it's, so it's 4% of our operating budget. Oh. Uh, Chair, committee members, in addition to the uh, 5% from the prior year that was carried forward, we also maintain our MS reserve at 15 million. So if there's anything above 15 million dollars, we pull that the operating budget this year. Okay. And Madam Chair, committee members, one of the things I would add to that is with our with our motor vehicle sales tax reserve, as uh, Ms. Bogey just mentioned, we've estimated that we need about 15 million dollars minimum in that reserve because as you could anticipate, when we budget, we need a certain amount of money coming in every single month. But with motor vehicle sales tax, depending upon the weather, depending upon the seasonality of the motor vehicle sales tax, with motor vehicle sales, it's, that's not consistent throughout the year. You're gonna have the peaks and the valleys with, with, the, with the sales of the vehicles, but we need to maintain a consistent operation. 
So because of the, the seasonality of the motor vehicle sales, we need to have a minimum of $15 million in that motor vehicle sales tax reserve to get us out of the peaks and valleys of the seasonality. Okay, on the expense side, uh, you can see on the expense side, Metro Transit bus is the largest portion, about 58% of the budget. Uh, we have then the Metro Transit, the capital, that's the capital salaries for, for folks from our engineering department that are working on all the capital projects. Uh, we have the Green Line in at $43 million, its sister uh, company in for $40.6 million, which is the Blue Line. Uh, North Star Operations at just over $20 million. Uh, Metro Mobility of $94 million. Then the Transportation Planning Division, which is part of MTS, it was $8.8 .8 million. Their contractor regular route service of $23 million and the Transit Lake service, Transit Lake service of $8, $8 million. Gives us our total of our $621 million budget. We will now go into the respective budgets. I'll go through the Metro Transit portion, and Heather will go into the MTS portion of those right. details. So before we move into the two different groups, anyone have questions on the big picture? All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So moving into Metro Transit, some of our budget assumptions moving into 2019. First of all, we'll be maintaining our 2019 service levels uh, with, with contingency for overloads and bus support. Uh, once again, our, our 2019 service levels are tied to the transportation policy plan based upon the service standards for all the different routes. Uh, when we do set our service levels and set our service for the year, we, that then drives the number of operators we need, number of mechanics, our fuel, and our parts to meet that service plan. As I talked about in the last meeting, that's about 65 to 70% of our budget is just service on the street. So the biggest piece of our service is tied to the transportation policy plan and the standards that guides 70% of our budget. We do have the 2019 customer improvements that we just talked about, which would be improving the customer communications, the safety, uh, the, the cleanliness on the trains and the stations, and our winter performance. Uh, I'll go through in a slide in a couple moments, the ridership, but we are forecasting on the Metro Transit side, 79.7 million rides. That's a combination of the Metro Transit, the large bus, the light rail, and the commuter rail. Uh, diesel fuel, we're budgeting in at 2.30 a gallon at the 7.5 million gallons of forecasted consumption. Uh, we do have continued anticipated funding for the Metro Blue Line, Green Line, and North Star. As we discussed at the last meeting, we do have five-year master operating funding agreements with the respective counties. So this is in concert with those agreements. Uh, as Joan and Jim talked about earlier with the Southwest Line, uh, we're hoping to uh, apply for a full funding grant agreement in fall of 19 with, uh, with uh, FFGA sometime early 2020. And as we discussed, we have discussed, we will discuss with you in the future, we're working on our light rail and commuter rail overhaul programs. In my mind, all the light rails and commuter rails are star old brand new. But in reality, the green line, or excuse me, the blue line started in 2004. It's now 15 years old. Green line started in 2014. It's now five years old. And, and North Star started in 2009. So it's like you always think that they're, they're brand new, but they, we have to do continued overhaul programs. So we're going through overhaul ones, twos, and threes. It could be include windows, traction motors, air conditioning units, many different things according to the manufacturer specs. Because for example, a light rail vehicle, light rail vehicle the forecasted light of, life of a light rail vehicle is 30 years. So we've got to go ahead and maintain these vehicles to maintain them in a state of good repair so we can get that 30 year life out. If we don't make the 30 year life, we have, the, we have the handshake right now with the federal government. They provided funding on those light rail vehicles. If we, if we uh, remove those vehicles from service prior to the end of your, their useful life, we will owe the federal government back then money. It's just like with a bus or anything else that they have put dollars into. They give you the dollars, you have the handshake that you will maintain that asset in a state of good repair through its useful life. So all of our vehicles are continuing to move through their overhaul programs. Ridership, as I talked about a few moments, moments ago, 79.7 uh, uh, million rides for next year. Uh, there's some positive things and some things I want to discuss with you. First of all, light rail ridership continues to be very strong for our system. Overall, light rail ridership for the budget 19 to 20, we're forecasting an increase of just under 5%, about 4.8%, going from 19 to 20. Very strong ridership on both the blue and the green line. North Star ridership continues to be strong. We're forecasting about a 1% increase in its ridership from 19 to 20. The challenges, as we've discussed in previous meetings, is our bus ridership. Right now, our bus ridership, we're forecasting right now a decrease in ridership from the 2019 budget to the 2020 budget of about 5%, about 2.9 million rides. That has about $4 million impact to our budget. We have seen, we've, we've seen our ridership on our bus since our fare 
increase that we did back in 2017, the ridership on the bus is holding down about 5%. It has, it's not returning. We know it's impacts of the construction, gas prices, but we also know it's lingering impacts of the, of the fare increase. So one of the challenges, if, if you were to ask me, what is one of the biggest challenges in the, in the 2020 budget for Metro Transit? It would be bus ridership. That is one of our significant challenges. Okay, so I will go through the Metro Transit family of expenses. Uh, first of all, Metro Transit bus operations. On the right-hand side, you see motor vehicle sales tax. You do not see state appropriations. As we discussed state appropriations, you'll see that in light rail operations, <coughs> Metro Mobility, and commuter rail. You will not see that in bus operations. So motor vehicle sales tax is about 66% of our budget. Uh, we have passenger fares, we have federal funds uh, to cover uh, the capital salaries and some CMEC, oper and CMEC operations. Other revenue, which would be advertising revenue, uh, use of reserves, and then the fund transfer, which would be the motor vehicle sales taxes uh, reserves coming in. The expense side, as you would anticipate, we're a very labor intensive organization, operators, mechanics, cleaners. 78% uh, of, our, of our salaries and benefits or 78% of our budget is salaries and benefits. We have our materials in at $20 million or 6%. Utilities in at about 1% of our budget. Regional allocations, that's for regional services that we receive from the, from the corporate office. That would be the executive department, uh, payroll, uh, the budget department, IS, human resources, diversity, equity, all the different corporate functions that are then allocated across the council. As we've discussed in previous budget presentations, I know, I know Ms. Bogio also talked about too, is the fact is that it's much more efficient for an organization to have a central office and allocate it out versus each individual business unit having their own duplicate functions. So that is what the council has chosen to do. And then for diesel fuel, as we talked about, uh, 230 a gallon, and at $16 million, or about 4% of our budget. Now we can move on to blue line operations. Blue line operations, you'll see a little different change on the revenue side on the left-hand side. You see state funding in. You don't see motor vehicle sales tax. You see state funding, which is state appropriations. Uh, you have passenger fares of $13 million or 33%. Other revenue, which would be advertising revenue to wrap the trains. A planned use of reserves of $600,000. And then you see county funding, funding $13.3 million. On the blue line, we get our, we get our subsidy from Hen Hennepin County through our master operating funding agreement. The change you'll see now if you move on to the green line, it looks as, oh, excuse me, I'll back up here first of all. On the blue line, uh, on the expense side, still very labor intensive. About 51% of our budget is salaries and benefits for operators, mechanics, cleaners, fuelers, those, or not, they don't have fuelers, I'm sorry, it's electricity on the, on the, on the blue line. Propulsion costs, so instead of diesel fuel, we have propulsion, which is electricity, the overhead can't marry electricity. Utility costs, regional allocations, uh, materials and supplies, modal allocations. That is for shared services within the Metro Transit family. That is allocating a cost, for example, for like the executive department, the grants department. The biggest piece would be the police department. We have our police department, with it, but then it's allocated across Metro Transit bus, the two light rails, and commuter rail. So that would be probably about 80% of the modal allocation would be the police department. So now when we move into the green line, one of the different changes that we'll talk about there is you see the revenues all look the same. Is a blue line. It's the same type of split with the uh, state funding, passenger fares, other revenue, reserves, and the counties. The difference on the green line is it not only includes Hennepin County, but it also includes Ramsey County. And then you'll see on the expense side, it's a $43.5 million budget. The same break, the same similar breakdowns as, uh, as blue line. Now we move into North Star. North Star has a different look than the rest of them. North Star is a $20.8 million budget. So you'll see the state funding once again, state appropriations is $7.1 million. You'll see the fares, reserves. The rest of it's a little different. So I'll go through the math, the math exercise here again with North Star. North Star funding, the net subsidy is broken into uh, four different pots. 41.95% would come from the state of Minnesota. 41.95% would come from the counties of Hennepin County and Anoka County. 8.05%, which would be the portion that's in greater Minnesota outside of the seven county metro, up in Sherburn County. 8.05% would then come from Sherburn County. And then MnDOT matches 8.05%, the portion that's in greater Minnesota. 
So you got the 41.95% from the state, 41.95% from the two counties within the seven county metro, 8.05% from Sherburne outside, 8.05% from MnDOT on the outside of our seven county metro. So that's the difference on the revenue side. On the expense side, you'll also notice a difference on, on North Star. You don't see many, you see salaries and benefits are only 24% of our budget. The biggest piece of that though is the counter piece would be the BNSF contract. We contract with Burlington Northern to operate our trains. Our conductors, all those people are operating our trains here. Question? Uh, Council Member Zarin. Yeah, I do have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just dawned on me that Wright County doesn't have any skin in the game here. It, uh, uh, I'm, I represent uh, Noka County. Okay. There's quite a few riders that drive from uh, Wright County into uh, to ride on the North Star. Is there where? Did, how did the agreement come to where um, an adjacent county that's benefiting from North Star uh, they don't contribute? any to the cost um, madam chair committee members well my knowledge of when uh the original funding agreement for north star was was part of the north star Co Co corridor development authority when they when they laid it out they based they based the funding based upon the trackage within the counties they would they did not look at where people were driving from into park and rides they looked at the trackage within res respective counties of hennepin anoka sure and that's how the funding agreement was developed. Beyond that, I'm not familiar yeah, with no. anything General else. Manager Koistra. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I just I would just mention that this is this is a, a the truth across our system in the bus system. For example, we have the taxi transit taxing uh, district, uh, and that ta those taxes pay for the park rides and buses and so forth, the 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 rolling stock and so forth. Yet we have people from out, many, many people from outside the transit taxi district that come in and, and use the park and rides and use utilize the bus service. So uh, it's not it's not a satisfying answer, only no. to say that it's bigger it's bigger than you think, perhaps because it's throughout our system we have people outside uh, the tax the taxi districts utilizing the services that benefit from the taxi districts. And Madam Chair and Committee Members, one of the things I will also add to our marketing department, about every couple of years, they will actually go out to our respective park and rides, whether it's up in Maple Grove or whether it's in Woodbury, whatever the case may be, and they'll actually do license plate studies. And they'll take some studies to see where are people coming from. Some, somewhat like what you're, what okay. you're mentioning also. And you go to Woodbury and there's a lot of people from Wisconsin. Yeah. So we'll be the first thing you notice. Um, so. <laughs> You? Thank you. Um, so I had a question. So um, as well, while we're on this slide, so the modal allocations, uh, how is that decided between the different, um, the light rail and the commuter rail and the bus? Okay. Especially Good. for police, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. The modal allocations, a lot of it is based upon usage. For example, like on, on the, for the, like the police expense, which is the largest portion of it, it would be based upon the number of police that are being used to like patrol the blue line, the green line, do the fair compliance on North Star, do all the different respective checks. Some of the some of the departments, for example, like the grants department or like the executive department, they would be allocated based on, we just use an allocation methodology, which would be ridership. Mm -hmm. But if any, any of the ones that we can identify, like police, that is based upon actual utilization. Thank you. All right, any other questions right now? All right, we can And then, I, Madam Chair, then I'd finish on this slide then. As, as I mentioned, the largest piece of the expense is BNSF. They actually run our operations on North Star. Uh, that's about about $6.5 million or 32% of our budget. Then you have the balance of the all the other costs that are consistent with the other lines. That brings us to an overall consolidator for Metro Transit, which is uh, about a $463 million, let me get to my slide, a $463 million budget. You can see overall, I'll talk about on the salaries and benefits, overall on the salaries and benefits. You can see about a 3.8% increase in salaries and benefits. Uh, we, have our, we have our planned standard contracts from the council that have been set, but also this also reflects the additional three staff that are being added to the Transit Control Center, and additional 16 staff now that are being added for the cleaning of the stations and, and all of our facilities. Uh, you can see fuel propulsion is 10.8 million about a 10.8% increase, about $2 million increase. Uh, the biggest piece of that is due to the fuel. Uh, fuel last year was budgeted in at $1.84 a gallon. 
it is budgeted this year at 230 a gallon based on fuel forward pricing, but that's where the contract, so basically 1 24th of our contracts every month come due, we renew it. So the average price for next year will be 230 a gallon. You'll see a uh, reduction in materials and supplies. It's down about $1.5 million or 5%, mainly due to the fact that we've been getting a number of new buses. With the new buses come warranty packages, warranty, first of all, parts packages, but also warranties. As buses are being repaired, we get the re warranty back from the manufacturer. Uh, you see about a 10% increase or about a $4 million increase in RA allocations. That's mainly driven by IS costs for a lot of system support and maintenance costs of our new systems. And then our other costs are in at 3.15%. So it gives us an overall increase of about $18.1 million or 4.1. Then the final slide then brings in, it takes over the, the 2020 budget from the previous slide, but then brings in the capital portion. About $23 million of our staff are being paid for with capital salaries. Brings Metro Transit to a total budget then of $487 million, which should include Metro Transit large bus, blue, green line, North Star. And with that, Madam Chair, I am, that's the Metro Transit portion, and I would stand for any questions, or we could move on with Heather. Uh, Council Member Zarin. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a lot of questions tonight, and thank you for entertaining me with us. Uh, you know, I, I get, a, get a report from last, but I also get a report from the people in the field, uh, people that are actually run, uh, they operate the buses and uh, fix the buses. And um, there was a comment that was given to me that uh, the buses have uh, a maintenance cycle. And uh, it was brought to my attention that the tools that are uh, required for those maintenance cycles are not always procured at the time when the bus is uh, bought. Uh, is there a way that we can uh, start to consider making sure that we have the proper tools for mechanics that are trained to use them uh, and, uh, and have them in their hands uh, so we're not waiting for, uh, for the re requisition to happen after the fact. We already know that the, uh, the bus is going to need this tool. We should, it should be available. Is, General Manager. Any comment on I'll that? talk to, to uh, I saw that Brian Funk, our, our, our uh, Deputy Chief Operating Officer of Buses, just, just left, but I'll talk to him about uh, what that's about. Sometimes those stories are a little more complicated than they first appear, and, and uh, I'll, we'll, I'll talk to him about it, and I'll get back to you. Because it, 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 on the surface, it seems nonsensical that people don't have the tools they need uh, to, to uh, work on the buses that, that are, are being procured. So. Uh, I'd like to look back into it a little bit further and see what, what the whole story is on this. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions? Councilmember Sterner. All right, thank you. Just uh, trying to wrap my hands, but the like the BRT, does that go under the buses for the budget then? Like overall bus, the BRT lines are included with that part of the budget. And I'm sure community members. Yeah, for example, like the A line, that, that would be under the Metro Transit bus operations. Okay, one, one more. And then the, the same thing with our suburban uh, opt-outs. They have their own budget, or are they, they partially in uh, somewhat in the budget as well? Then, uh, Madam Chair, council members, uh, the suburban, it's a little bit of both. So suburban transit providers all have their own budget, and part of that budget is made up of funding that we pass through, and I'll talk about that a little bit okay. further on into the MTS operating budget. All right, stay tuned. Thank you. All right, additional questions? All right. Turn it over to Heather. We're getting there. Okay, so let's transition to the MTS family of services. So you've likely heard this before, but our major responsibilities include serving as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, and operating a number of contracted transit services, including Metro Mobility, Contracted Regular Route, and Transit Link Dial a Ride service. And also, we do pass through money to the suburban transit providers. And I'll provide a bit more detail about all of these services as we move through our presentation. So the MTS budget is constructed a bit differently than the Metro Transit one. So we are built from a base that includes meeting federal and state requirements and implementing past council actions, including negotiated labor and service provider rates. You'll see this in future slides, but when you were looking at the Metro Transit budget, the biggest slice of their pie tended to be um, 
it, it was salaries. You're going to see the biggest piece of our pies in most cases is going to be service contracts just based upon our model of service. Um, so as Ed mentioned, the council budget is one area where you, are in, where, where you will inherit decisions from the past council, and at some point in the future, your decisions will carry on. That is particularly true for the MTS budget because a lot of times we procure contracts and they're five-year contracts, so a lot of that is really just baked into our budget from the time that a contract is signed. So there's a good deal to absorb in the transportation budget, and one of the key storylines that Ed mentioned on the Metro Transit side was bus ridership. On the MTS side, it's going to be Metro Mobility. Metro Mobility ridership continues to grow, and this year's service will expand to Lakeville as a result of the past legislative session. We are also implementing a number of recommendations from the Metro Mobility Task Force. Our preliminary 2020 operating program is about $134 million. And one significant difference you'll see, again, just gonna call this out because it's gonna look very different, is that we're gonna have a lot of contracted rates in there. We also anticipate that we're gonna be going out for bid for somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 contracts this year. So that does put a little bit of variability into what our budget may look like depending upon what happens um, when the RFPs come in and are, and are executed. Uh, I should mention that RFPs will come before the council, so you'll have uh, an opportunity to weigh in as that process proceeds. So this chart represents our MTS ridership over time, and there's a few trends I'd like to call out. The first is that Metro Mobility ridership <coughs> is presented in blue, and you'll see that that continues to grow over time. That continues to put pressure on our budget. The second trend I'd like to call out is our contracted fixed route in yellow. Our ridership ebbs and flows depending upon which and how many routes we are asked to provide. This number increases and decreases based on the council's overall service plan. In 2020, we are currently forecasting flat ridership with the exception of Metro Mobility. And the reason we are forecasting flat ridership is we're gonna have a full year of a new route. So sometimes there, so Metro Transit operates larger buses, and we often operate smaller buses, so sometimes it is more cost-effective to operate routes with a smaller bus than Metro Transit would with a 40-foot bus or a larger articulated bus. The third item I'd like to call out on this chart is the Metro Red Line. Uh, the Red Line is the region's first BRT line, and it opened in mid-2013, and that operates under MTS with a contract with um, MBTA. So the MTS budget includes, as a whole, includes Metro Mobility, Contracted Regular Route Service, Transit Link Dial Ride, and Transportation Planning. So we're about $134 million, and over 80% of our revenue comes from the State General Fund and Motor Vehicle Sales Tax. On the expense side, nearly three quarters of our division budget is used to fund Metro Mobility. Our remaining budget is used to fund planning, a regular route, and Transit Link services, and we'll get into more detail of each of those. So let's take a little bit more time to just focus in on Metro Mobility. So I just do want to note that these are 2018 numbers and that some of you know, this has obviously changed over time, but just for consistency, we took the last full year that we have. So as a reminder, and I know you've heard a number of presentations about Metro Mobility, but we provide transit service for persons certified under the ADA who cannot use regular fixed route buses due to a disability or health condition. Services provided by private vendors under contract with MTS. So the service model of Metro Mobility is designed to meet state and federal regulations. That means we have significantly less flexibility to adjust our program than other council transit services. The service has grown disproportionate to the other transit services in the region. Between 2013 and 2018, ridership grew over 30%, and we have in the neighborhood of 62,000 certified riders. Now this ridership growth is really significant because of how the Metro Mobility model grows. If you are on a regular route bus, that's going to cost the same whether you have 10 people on that bus or 50 people boarding that bus. On the average Metro Mobility bus, you're going to have one or two drivers, or excuse me, one or two riders. So as the ridership goes up, our operating costs proportionally go up with ridership. Um, we will be back to talk to you more about our capital budget later this summer, but as you can imagine, if you can only have one or two riders per bus, and if you're having to increase your fleet in order to meet state and federal requirements, this puts a lot of pressure on our capital budget as well. So we face a number of challenges in Metro Mobility. Um, 
We have rising demand as our population ages. We have general wage pressure driven by market conditions. So as we go out for bid on contracts, we are often seeing that in order to have drivers that we, we see those costs increase. Uh, we also have a number of new initiatives I'd like to highlight. The first is that we're going to be expanding service to the Lakeville to comply with um, legislation that was passed in this last session. This service will add roughly a million dollars of annual operating expenses to Metro Mobility and require the purchase of additional buses. The bus purchase came before you, I think, within the last couple of months, so it's a pretty recent uh, purchase that we made. Um, other new initiatives I'd like to highlight implement key recommendations from the Metro Mobility Task Force. As a reminder, the task force was established during the 2017 special legislative session and it had two primary goals. That included identifying options to increase program efficiency and effectiveness and to minimize program costs and improve service, including potential partnership with taxi service providers and transportation network companies, in layman's terms, some sort of Uber Lyft type model. Um, so right now, the council and DHS are actively working to share certain data in order to coordinate special transportation services between the agencies. There is a potential here to draw down federal money to fund transportation for individuals that participate in DHS programs, including day training and habilitation, senior daycare programs, and other non-emergency medical transportation and waivered services. Before the council and DHS can develop a program to capture those federal funds, we need to know what the ridership is. We don't know right now how many people are potentially influenced. So with this last legislative session, they basically said, okay, DHS and Met, Con and Met Mobility, you can, you can share data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna merge our data, figure out what the population is, where we can look at this program, and then we may design a program. We don't know what that is and we'll be keeping you updated as we go forward. We do not have any cost savings programmed in our 2020 budget for this and we're going to have to see what that looks like but we'll, we'll keep you updated as the year goes on and, and with our 2021 budget. Second, we are working to implement an on-demand service pilot. The major component of the service option is that we'll offer an on-demand one-seat ride similar to the experience of taking a Lyft or an Uber for all Metro Mobility customers. The pilot will provide an option for existing customers who may not need the level of service provided by the regular Metro Mobility based system. By adding this option, we'll create a more diversified system that has the potential to expand customer choice, improve base system capacity, and reduce the average cost per trip. A key goal of the pilot is to explore the service market potential and examine the overall impacts of ridership, program cost, and customer experience. We anticipate that many customers will be able to make good use of this service option and therefore rides will shift from the base Metro Mobility traditional system into this new pilot. So stay tuned. So when you put all of that together, when you take the new initiatives, you know, both those that have been recommended by the Metro Mobility Task Force and those asked of us by the state legislative session, we are coming in at a budget of just over $94 million. On the revenue side, state general fund and, pa and passenger fees pays for nearly all of the Metro Mobility expenses and is represented by both the reserves and state appropriation section of the pie chart. About 90% of Metro Mobility expenses are used to pay for service on the street. That would include the actual provider expense for the contract, fuel, and materials category. Our current budget projects about a 6.2% ridership increase in 2020. We continue to monitor ridership monthly and very closely on Metro Mobility, and we may adjust our ridership assumption prior to going into the public comment draft and potentially the final budget that we're asking you to adopt. Here's why. A general rule of thumb, about a 1% change in Metro Mobility ridership is going to be about $750,000. So relatively minor adjustments in Metro Mobility ridership add up really quickly or it can be cost savings really quickly. So just know that is an area that we may be coming back to you with a change later in this calendar year. So the remaining portion of our budget is used to help make the program work. So 4% of our budget pays for staff salaries and regional allocations for services needed to do our work. As Ed said, this is cost like communications, HR, and IS services. We are requesting one new FTE this year, and that's for customer service staff to help meet the growing man demand for Metro Mobility. 
The remaining 5% of our budget pays for contract and services, consulting, and smaller ticket items like printing and small office equipment. This is the area of our budget we're closely looking at and monitoring for opportunities to support the MCUB program. We've met with procurement and EEO staff and continue to look for opportunities to support the MCUB businesses. So overall, we have, we have captured all of the non-Metro Mobility contracted family of services in this slide. That includes regular route, transit link, and van pool. So as with Metro Mobility, we contract with private vendors and government organizations to operate regularly scheduled service throughout the metropolitan area. By design, our buses and services have similar branding to Metro Transit. So you, as a customer, you will never know if it's, a, if it's a service directly provided by Metro Transit or under contract with MTS. It's one of the ways that we do. One, it, it saves us money on different graphics packages on our buses, and two, it's a more seamless um, experience for our customers. Um, just wanted to also note that contracted regular route does include the Metro Red Line. So I think as you know, TransitLink provides demand response transit service in portions of the metropolitan area where regular route transit service is infrequent or unavailable. Metro Van Pool is the council's commuter van pool program. It provides financial assistance for van pools of five or more people, including a volunteer driver, commuting to and from work destinations throughout the region and not well served by the regular route transit network. Contracted regular route, transit link, and van pool budgets have been designed to maintain current service levels. These services are funded primarily through motor vehicle sales tax and passenger fares. Our expense side looks very similar to Metro Mobility in that the majority of our expenses are in transit provider costs. The no, I don't. Sorry, Brazil. I was just. Go ahead. Hoping. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my mistake. No um, so, so the Transportation Planning and Administration budget includes work related to the Council's role as the MPO and central finance and administration work within the division, including subrecipient monitoring and management. As the region's federally designated MPO, the Council works with local, state, and federal policymakers to anticipate and plan the best ways to meet all the transportation <clears throat> needs for our growing region. Federal funding for transportation projects and programs are channeled through the MPO planning process. Major projects in 2020 include continuing work on the travel behavior inventory, and I know Jonathan Ehrlich was before you fairly recently to talk about the TBI in detail, but as a brief refresher, the TBI informs transportation planning and forecasting for all major projects in the region. The TBI also represents a regional funding partnership and is funded by MnDOT, the regional solicitation, and council sources. We are also doing a number of other studies in 2020. A presentation specifically on this topic will come before this committee in September, prior to the council's release of the public comment draft budget. But as a preview, one of the bigger studies is the Twin Cities Mobility Needs Analysis. The goal of this study will be to help the region define how much it will cost to address congestion in the Twin Cities over the next 20 years. This analysis is directly called for the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan Update Work Program. So the council passes through motor vehicle sales tax and state appropriation funding to suburban transit providers, including Maple Grove, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, Plymouth, and Southwest Transit. We pass through funds as required by law and in accordance with the council's state transit funding policy that was adopted in December of 2017. The regional funding policy has been a source of tension for years, and it may be something that you hear about. The suburban transit providers want more funds, and we agree. Everybody in the region wants and needs more money for our system to operate in the way that we would want it to. The new policy did give suburban providers much of what they had requested from the council, including more freedom. Right now, in the, we're anticipating passing through in the neighborhood of about $38 million to suburban transit providers, and we will know that final dollar amount once we get the November forecast later this year. Now let's roll the entire budget together. I'm not going to walk through every line, but I wanted to call out a few items. So let's start with the expense lines. So Metro Mobility is increasing due to ridership growth, both in our base ridership and expansion into Lakeville, and about a $1 million in new initiatives. The majority of the new initiative funding is for that on-demand pilot that we just talked about. 
regular route services have increased because of a route shift between Metro, Metro Transit and MTS. So it's one of those cases where the service plan just switched it from one side to the other. Um, planning's budget has decreased due to, a short, due to short term or one time regional projects that will complete in 2019. Base levels of work will remain constant. So the revenues have been adjusted to account for the expense variations. General Fund and MVEST are increasing to pay for Metro Mobility and Contracted Service Adjustments. And federal funding is decreasing due to pass through federal grants expiring and an anticipated decrease in the amount of grant funding in the Transit Link program. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the MTS side of the budget that you may have. All right, any questions from council members? Councilmember Sterner. Okay, kind of brought up a variation of this before, but I, I understand how fair is make a ridership go down, but it looks like disproportionately like with uh, Metro Transit, the, the percentage of what the riders pay the fare versus with Metro Mobility seems like a lot more. And I don't know if there's a way to kind of like level with the fairness or are we dealing with people on fixed incomes or, or just the cost per ride makes it uh, where that fare is not as much. I'm just kind of one, just commenting on that what you're seeing them first, what I'm seeing kind of thing. Um, Madam Chair, committee members, first of all, on the on the fares for Metro Mobility, Metro Mobility, the maximum fare can be two times a regular route fare. Okay, that's where, yeah. Then if and as one Heather, one, as one Heather one. had mentioned, the, the, the issue with Metro Mobility is the fact is that you basically got, you got one bus, one operator, and generally one yeah. passenger, and they can only collect twice, the right. maximum is twice They're, a regular route. One run rider, it's basically the set. So that's yeah. where the other that's the program right. that uh, with the lift uh, that the Dakota <laughs> County and you're doing will help some of those costs of that and then the speed of the pickup too as well so okay. and i believe with the federal part of the law it's, it's we're capped at two times what we have for regular route service okay all right thank you and, and madam chair committee members if i might one of the one of the slides that we often show that we didn't slide didn't show here is that when you look at how our metro mobility program um, operates comparatively across the nation we are one of the most efficient systems and that that's that's some information we can certainly pass along okay thank you Heather. Uh, yeah there's a lot of great information on the metro mobility task force report um, where we did a lot of comparing to peer agencies so it's it's worth a look to kind of get into the weeds a little bit if you want to yeah. learn a lot of detail but all right uh, anybody else? Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. Just a, a question on again on metro mobility. Just looking at the <clears throat> the revenue side, in which state appropriations are about eighty six percent, but we have that exponential growth uh, every year. Is there a possibility that the state appropriations will keep pace with increasing ridership, or is this a structural uh, deficit that will never be dealt with? Um, Madam Chair, Council Members, I think that is the million dollar question or the multi-million dollar question. Um, it looks like Mr. Koyster would like to say something on that. Uh, well, I was just going to mention that one of the significance, the uh, significance of how they changed the budgeting is that they isolated metro mobility costs in the state budget. And, and that means that they can no longer say we gave a bunch of money to transit and, and and then Metro Mobility gets the first dollar off the top because that's a required service that we have to fund. So, so I think it's significant that the legislature now has to look at the Metro Mobility budget as a separate program, and it's a federally mandated program, and that places more pressure on them to both fund Metro Mobility and to isolate those costs away from what the, the bus pressure is, whereas before it was just all lumped, uh, all lumped together, and they kind of said, here, do what you want. And, and we had this hierarchy of funding that really hurt us. So I think that, that we have a better chance the way it's constructed now in state budget than what we had before, whereas in the past, Metro we get a lump sum of money, Metro Mobility would get funded first, bus would get funded last. So as I said earlier, never missed an opportunity to talk about it, but this is where we talk about one-time funding makes it challenging to plan. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to have long-term planning, both for Metro Mobility and for Metro Transit, and that's that's how those things um, really come to being able to make good service planning decisions in the long run. Uh, Council Member Atlas and Britson. Yeah, one of the things I was wondering about is, are we looking at also, I know we have the pilot project, but are we also looking at how we might better place or serve 
place communities or, or buildings where you have an increased number of people who would be using Metro Mobility with uh, regular types of bus service. It, it, I just know that in one of my communities, for example, there's a new development going in and the closest regular bus service is a quarter of a mile away, which does not work for this population. But if there was a bus stop, you know, right outside the door, then that could work and would maybe alleviate. So, so I'm just curious if we're looking at our, the two halves of the house and looking for opportunities for innovation and, and maybe disrupting ourselves. Sure, I can answer a little bit of that and then I'll leave it to experts in the room to correct me. Um, so we have been doing just the same thing out of that Metro Mobility Task Force, doing some piloting of even getting um, people to places where there is um, people who uh, can use regular route service, but to centralize to get people. And it's the same sort of principle of trying to look at that, especially for Metro Mobility Services. So right now we've gone through some piloting. Um, I, I, we should probably be knowing where we're headed with it. Um, I don't see, I see Jerry back there, but Christine's might be the right one to answer. And, um, and so some of those studies periods should be kind of wrapping up to see what worked and what didn't work. So, but we'll, we'll get you some information. Yeah, I guess maybe just so to make sure I'm just thinking as we have people who are gathering in mm -hmm. retirement communities and those are expanding in locations, are we prioritizing bus stops in those areas? If, is it the same question? A slightly different question. That's the one I was looking at. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but we can also look into that. So, okay. Any additional questions? All right, so uh, the next step, so we're going to have a conversation with all the different uh, divisions of the budget on Wednesday. Um, and then um, after that, um, the next step is we adopt our preliminary um, levy and budget uh, <clears throat> at the end of August. And then ultimately, then it will be the final budget in December. So there's a lot of things that will happen here pretty quickly. And I know you all serve with other committees as well. So um, make sure to reach out if you've got questions as you absorb all these numbers. Um, I know Ed and Heather are always willing to answer questions, as is Mary. Um, so don't hesitate as you kind of ponder some of these things to uh, reach out and get your questions answered because it's a lot of information to take in. So, all right. Thank you. I Thank told you. you we'd make it through, and it's 6.30, so I'm really happy. So, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.